the Cyber Defense Center at INCD, and it's a great honor for me to be here today and be the host of this event. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank you all for coming today to hear and participate in this special event, and of course, many thanks to the co-organizer, Tel Aviv University, and the Ministry of Trans uh, Transportation, and uh, many others that I must have uh, missed. In the, in the next few hours, we are going to have a very interesting uh, sessions and talks about transportation systems, once orchestrated by mechanical precision, and now we are, are vulnerable to cyber attacks. The infrastructure that underpins our daily lives is being targeted by those who wish to disturb and compromise the very fabric of our life. Imagine a world where traffic lights bend to the will of malicious actor. Picture the horror of her plane held hostage by the hands of the unseen adversaries. Envision the chaos when the trust we place in autonomous vehicle is betrayed as hacker assume control over the steering wheel. The consequences of cyber attacks are profound as the reliability, efficiency, and safety of our trains, buses, vessels, airplanes, and other modes of mass transit hang in the balance. Over the past few years, alongside the technological development of transportation around the world, we are witnessing an increase in attempts to attack the system that support the means of transportation and the infrastructures that support them. Some have managed to penetrate the core of systems of commercial aircraft. There are many publications about critical weaknesses in autonomous cars that have been exploited. Seaports continue to suffer damage to the crane system and port management and administration. Recently, there has been an increase in the number of cyber attacks on mass transportation companies that have led to leakage of personal and commercial information. All these and many more examples of successful attacks in the trans transportation sector require, require thinking at the national level and international cooperation in order to reduce the risk arising from cyber attacks and the chance that, we'll, that they will occur. So, it was short. Now we are ready to begin with our first lecture about transportation sector cybersecurity threat landscape. I would like to invite Mr. Adam Meyers to the stage <laughs> as CrowdStrike's Senior Vice President of Intelligence elites the threat intelligence line of business for the company. Adam, the mic is yours. Uh, show of hands, how many people were at the session yesterday? Okay, a couple. Some of this will be a little bit of a repeat for you, so you'll be very good at the content. Thank you uh, for the time today. I have 20 minutes? Okay, I'll take no more than 40. Uh, so, uh, who is familiar with CrowdStrike? It's an intimate room, so I'll make this very interactive. Okay, I see some hands. So, um, when we first started CrowdStrike, our focus was on tracking threat actors and figuring out who's behind all of these cyber attacks. This was somewhat provocative when we first started doing this, uh, but the goal is that if we understand which threat actors target business verticals, geolocations, will be in a better position to defend against those attacks. And understanding the threat actors starts with understanding the motivation. And from our perspective, there's three primary motivations. Nation state. Nation state threat actors engage in sabotage, espionage, disruptive, destructive attacks. And in the case of North Korea, also financially motivated attacks to generate revenue for the regime. E-crime, non-state actors who engage in a variety of activities primarily focused 
on generating revenue for themselves. I'm out of time? No. Uh, <laughs> the e-crime actors uh, initially stealing credentials, which they attempted, attempted to use for wire fraud and things like that, have now moved on to ransomware. And increasingly today, we see them engage in data extortion. And finally, hacktivists. Hacktivists are operating for a variety of reasons. Uh, generally, the goal is to bring attention to an issue or cause disruption. Uh, we've seen this in the transportation sector uh, very recently with groups associated with pro-Russian uh, initiatives going by, uh, by titles like No Name, for example, who targeted the transportation sector in the UK and also in France back in March with denial of service attacks in order to bring attention to their displeasure that these countries were supporting Ukraine uh, in this, this conflict with Russia. So by targeting the transportation sector, they start to bring more attention uh, for people, and hopefully for them, uh, th their hope is to disrupt transportation metros and, and mass transit in order to bring more attention to, uh, for people to, to maybe uh, criticize the government for supporting Ukraine. As we look at the threat landscape as it exists today, it's very broad, uh, over 215 different threats. At CrowdStrike, we use a cryptonym system to uh, describe these threat actors. You can see here, uh, I'll expand it out, I see some pictures being taken. Um, you can see here we have different names for different nation state threat actors. China is panda, Russia is bear, Iran is kitten. When we first started tracking Iranian threat actors, they were very immature, and we were thinking Persian cat for, uh, for Iran. What's an immature cat but a kitten? So that's the origin of the kitten title. Um, we see India, Pakistan as tiger and leopard. We see uh, all criminals we track as spider. Uh, hacktivist, activist, nationalist, and terrorist we ta track as jackal. And this problem is getting worse every single year. Last year, we added 33 new threat actors. Um, we've added more and more countries, Syria, Colombia, Turkey. South Korea, Vietnam. So every single day that goes by, we find more and more attacks. We track uh, these attacks on tens of millions of endpoints around the globe that we use to collect our telemetry uh, through a number of other sources that we employ to understand these threat actors. 216, 215 threat actors is pretty scary. Uh, INCD has their work cut out for them when they think about all of the uh, threat actors that are out there and, and what the potential is. But the good news is that these threat actors are not all targeting transportation, they're not all targeting Israel. So depending on which business vertical you're in, which geographic location you're in, you can create a subset of these threats. They have different capabilities, different intentions, different uh, things that they want to do. And so as we start to map that, we can kind of figure out who the primary actors are, and now we can reduce the number of threat actors we need to worry about. And so that's what I'm going to do for you right now. Uh, we'll take a look at the transportation vertical. Here's the good news. Transportation itself is not heavily targeted. Um, we see in terms of number of threat actors right now. We see criminal threat actors who target transportation uh, generally opportunistically. You can see a number of these spider groups up here. Um, Alpha Spider, for example, uh, uses the Alpha V ransomware. Uh, they opportunistically will target an organization, generally stealing a credential, authenticating, um, one of their favorite tactics is to go after things like ESXi hypervisor uh, from VMware, and they'll encrypt all of the virtual machines that are attached to that hypervisor in order to create a maximum disruption uh, in that environment. The other group that is uh, active targeting transportation is a group we track as Vanguard Panda. 
This is a group that has also been just uh, called uh, Volt Typhoon by Microsoft. There's been a lot of reporting on this group recently. The concern with Vanguard Panda is they're conducting what we call opera uh, operational preparation of the environment, meaning they're hacking for access right now. They break in to maintain access. And if there is elevated conflict or some sort of uh, heightened tensions with China, this group may then use their access to disrupt services. So the uh, messing with the traffic lights, um, but based on my commute over here today, that probably wouldn't make things much worse. <laughs> um, but the, uh, yeah, so these are the threat landscape for transportation. But it's important to understand that there are adjacent organizations, adjacent verticals that are necessary for transportation. Uh, the, the, thinking about traffic lights, for example, while those traffic lights are used for transportation, they're technology. So threats to the technology vertical become relevant for threats to the transportation vertical. So it's important to understand all of the adjacent verticals uh, that these threat actors may be targeting because that could create a situation where uh, there's more of a threat landscape. As we pan back and we look not just by vertical, but by geographic location, we can see the threats uh, here to Israel, which are a little bit more numerous than transportation itself. Uh, but you can see here that um, you know, now we're including Russia, we're including activist groups, we're including um, Iran, we're including North Korea. So as we think about threats to transportation in Israel, now we can kind of take a cross-section of these two to understand the total, this microphone's killing me, sorry, uh, to understand the total threat landscape. And so as we look uh, a little bit deeper, I think it's reasonable to assume that some of these groups you'll see, um, Festive Jackal, for example, is our name for Hezbollah. Uh, and so now you could assume that there's perhaps some intention from Hezbollah to target Israel. Maybe they would go after the transportation sector. We haven't observed that yet. But this is, as we think about how to properly defend transportation, now we can kind of understand that there's other risk, other threats who haven't been observed targeting transportation in Israel, but may have the intention. If you go back to that capability and intention chart, and so now we have a much better understanding of what this threat landscape would look like. Where this becomes important is as we look at the threat actor's behavior, they're constantly changing, they're evolving, they're finding new techniques, new capabilities. Uh, we track how long it takes, for example, for a threat actor to move from one system to another. We call this breakout time. In the last year, that breakout time went from 98 minutes to 84 minutes. So the threat actors got 14 minutes faster. And when I talk to customers, I always ask them, did you get 14 minutes faster in stopping these threats? And more importantly, do you even know how to measure how fast or effective you are at stopping these threats? Most organizations don't. We had an interesting discussion yesterday with the financial, financial sector where they asked, how do you quantify this? And so, you know, we, we started discussing that you can look at tickets for an incident. How long did it take for a ticket to get open? How long did it take for a ticket to get resolved? And now we can start to quantify what is our reaction time? How, how well can we react to these various threats? Um, we've seen that this is a complex ecosystem as well. It's not just the criminals, right? If we think back to transportation, and I mentioned Alpha, Alpha Spider, or the Alpha v ransomware, how do they get in? How do they get that initial access that lets them get into the ESXi hypervisor and try to encrypt all the virtual machines? They oftentimes buy that access. So compromised credentials that are available for five, 10, 20 shekels on the dark markets can become the first inroad for these threat actors. They can buy access to any number of targets, and once they decide that they want to target, let's say, transportation, 
uh, they can buy that access, get in as a legitimate user, and with maybe minimal effort to bypass something like multi-factor authentication, it can come in, and there's very little that will stop them until they deploy that ransomware. Um, and so this is uh, very important because we've seen a major explosion in the number of compromised credentials that are available for sale. Um, last year, we saw a 112% increase, 2,500 advertisements for access uh, by, these, by these access brokers. So that's a huge concern. So part of what organizations really need to do is keep visibility into things like the dark web looking for stolen credentials for their organization and making sure to remediate or to do password resets or to implement other security features to prevent this from happening. We've also seen that threat actors are increasingly moving away from using ransomware or any sort of malware in general. Last year, 71% of the attacks were what we call malware free, meaning they didn't use malware to get in. They did this to avoid EDRs, they did this to avoid detection and to make themselves uh, more successful in conducting their operations. Um, one of the broad trends we've seen is data weaponization. This is uh, a mural from a group that we track called Guacamaya. Guacamaya has been very active in Latin America, South America, um, but there's many groups like this all around the world. Um, certainly in, in places uh, like Turkey and Europe and the United States, where these hacktivist groups will weaponize data in what we call a hack and leak. What this means is they break in, they take sensitive, embarrassing data, they leak it on the internet in order to embarrass or delegitimize the organization. One example of what Guacamaya did was they broke into the Bureau of Prisons in El Salvador they identified that a politician had freed a, um, uh, somebody who was in jail for aggravated homicide, who was associated with a gang called Mara Salvatruccia, or MS-13, drove him to the border of Honduras, let him out, and um, Guacamaya was able to find this information and release it in order to discredit or embarrass that uh, politician. We also see data weaponization in the e-crime space. I mentioned ALF v. Ransomware earlier. Um, more and more, 20% of the threat actors that we track don't even deploy ransomware anymore. They simply steal the data in order to extort the victim. There's a lot of calculus that goes into the, uh, these scams, but um, in, in large part, the goal is to create enough downtime where they're able to uh, maximize the impact. And, uh, and the goal there is that if you have enough downtime, imagine in transportation, for example, if they take out all of the traffic lights in Tel Aviv, the longer that they do that, the more expensive, the more problematic this becomes. And so it's more likely that the municipality might pay in order to unlock their files. With data extortion, they don't have to do this. They can take all of the sensitive data of employees or customers and threaten to disclose that. And there's legal and regulatory and compliance impact from that. Right? Uh, things like GDPR and various other privacy policies get violated. Somebody's going to sue. Um, there, there could be financial costs associated with this. And so this is what the threat actors are now doing, is they've removed that ransomware and, and that time that they need to uh, actually kind of uh, disrupt the organization and they have an instant payout. They say it's a hundred million dollars if we release of, of legal fees and compliance if we release all of this sensitive data or you could pay us five million dollars. And so that's how they're able to kind of use data extortion to make things easier on themselves to make things faster. The ransomware playbook is built to when, when an organization gets hit by ransomware they try to drag out the negotiation. They grind the, vic the threat actor down on price, and they try to get them to make a mistake. They try to get them to give up some information. With data extortion, that goes away. Um, one of the, the problems that we face as an industry is that we've kind of 
said, okay, well, we're going to trust but verify. Uh, this is something associated with President Reagan. Uh, but the problem with trust but verify uh, is that in, the, in, in this day and age, we're seeing more and more threat actors use compromised credentials to kick off their intrusion. And when you do trust but verify, if they log in with username and password, they're trusted. And then you verify that they are who they say they are. We need to flip this dynamic and now say verify, then trust. Identity protection, identity tools are the concern that we need to think about moving forward. So as we think about how to better secure the transportation vertical in the, in the years and, and months to come, we really need to invest in proper identity protection to prevent these data extortion, data weaponization attacks from being successful. The other thing uh, that we've seen is a massive explosion in cloud. The cloud has uh, been targeted 95% more in the last year. The number of threat actors who understand how to operate in the cloud has grown nearly threefold. Actors like a group we track as Scattered Spider, who is able to log in with legitimate credentials that they social engineer using phishing attacks, they move laterally, and then they hide in between the cloud and the enterprise uh, and are able to conduct ransomware attacks. In fact, they use that alpha, uh, alpha V ransomware. They also are able to use the cloud for persistence. Um, and they're very effective at things like SIM swapping in order to bypass multi-factor authentication. Um, in addition, we've seen that the vulnerability landscape has changed. In the last year, Microsoft had 1,200 vulnerabilities that had to be patched, 28 zero days. Um, we've seen that there's been an explosion in the vulnerability threat landscape, which especially in sectors like transportation, there's a lot of proprietary tools, a lot of proprietary software and, and technology. And as the vulnerabilities in those products become identified, um, there's a whole new challenge of being able to patch and manage um, those, uh, those threat landscapes. The other thing I want to kind of point to, I mentioned Vanguard Panda. We've seen an explosion, and you can see here um, just how many verticals and geographic regions have been targeted by Chinese threat actors associated with the People's Republic of China. This has been growing for years and years. They've created a massive collection effort, and this is probably the number one threat for the transportation sector is that you have outside of e-crime, you have groups like China who are trying to collect information, understand proprietary technology used by that sector, understand the movement of people. Um, you know, if you expand transportation to include airlines and aerospace and the travel industry, uh, passenger uh, records are absolutely critical for tracking uh, dissidents tracking counterintelligence threats to the state of China. Uh, and finally, I'll just kind of wrap up here by kind of talking about the thing that I'm asked about by everybody, which is generative AI. Um, we've seen that there is a lot of utility in things like ChatGPT. Uh, you can summarize very complex topics very quickly. You can see here I've asked ChatGPT to summarize a very complex blog post about kernel uh, bypasses for EDRs. I said put it into three paragraphs, add MITRE ATT&CK information to it, and it did a fantastic job of that. Here's an example where I asked it to create a Python script to check my email for me and pull all of the hashes and IP addresses and domains that might be of interest out of the email, and it did a great job. I use this script every day. And then here, asking it to create a, a detection signature, a Yara rule, for a UPX pack binary. You could argue that there's more effective ways to do this or more efficient ways, but uh, it did a very good job just kind of getting it started. But it could also be used for bad. So you can see here threat actors um, could potentially use it for phishing with other generative AI, things like Google Bard. Um, and this is advancing so quickly. There's new announcements, new, new technology that comes out every single day. 
you can very effectively use it for creating, for example, phishing attacks. We have to be very careful with this technology. Um, one of the things that I hear from organizations or from people is, you know, you could, you could use this to write the, you know, some super awesome malware or find a really interesting new vulnerability. And I'll say that there's a, uh, a word of caution here. So you could see, um, you get what you kind of ask it. So this was me trying to generate a uh, machine learning algorithm that would look at, at security cameras and look for vehicles and objects and, and people and weapons. And uh, it, it detected this car, which is operated by a three-year-old who is very much a threat uh, to the transportation industry. I'll just put that out there. Um, he's, he's hit me multiple times. But um, you, you, know, you get what you pay for. If you tell it to ask for a vehicle, you might not necessarily get exactly the vehicle you're looking for. Um, and where that becomes evident is when you ask it to write code for you, for example. This is, a, this is a hallucination, which is the big concern with generative AI. You can see I asked it to create a, a Python script to allow me to ask ChatGPT a question. So ChatGPT should be pretty good at writing an API to talk to itself, you would think. But it completely fabricated this library. It completely fabricated this function. Um, and uh, I spent 30 minutes trying to figure out why I couldn't load this Python library only to realize it didn't exist. Um, and so even in a situation where a threat actor tries to use it to write malware or to do vulnerability research, it's entirely uh, possible that that's not going to work. And then they have to spend a lot of time still using their understanding of source code and, and development to debug and to test uh, this code. So it, it's not necessarily more efficient. Um, and so I'll very quickly wrap up here. I, I know I'm a, a few minutes over, but uh, the, the five things I'm, I'm asked or uh, when I travel around the world, customers and boards ask me, what, are, what do we need to do? How do we deal with this threat? How can the transportation sector deal with this threat? Number one, secure the enterprise. Good hygiene, vulnerability management, and increasingly I tell people to, to look at things like zero trust. Zero trust is not a technology, it's not a product, it's a methodology. Uh, need to know is, is uh, the, you know, what we typically would say in a government space. And so um, when we think about securing the enterprise, make sure that you are implementing identity management, zero trust. Number two is you have to be threat hunting. You cannot wait for a, a threat actor to get access to the traffic light system or to get access to the trains you need to be out there looking and engaging and finding these threat actors. I told you in one of my first slides that uh, 84 minutes was the average time for a threat actor to move from one system to another. And if you are able to identify, investigate, and remediate within the first hour, then you're going to be able to get ahead of that threat actor, stop them from moving off their initial system into another one, and in a, you're in a much better position to protect your enterprise. Number three, next-gen protection. Uh, Signature-based antivirus is long dead. Uh, you need to make sure that you are employing artificial intelligence machine learning at the endpoint to identify malicious or anomalous activity and stop it. Number four, drill. You, you play like you practice. You have to do these exercises, these, you know, go into the boardroom and say, what would happen if we were hit by ransomware? What would happen if uh, you know, we had a bad day? Who are we going to call? Do we have outside counsel? Do we have who's, who's going to do the comms to, to the public? It's cheap. It's fast. And like I said, you play like you practice. If you don't practice, you're going to fall on your face. And finally, know the adversary. Have the intelligence. Have that information about who these threat actors are. And then you're in a much better position to articulate your defenses and to instrument your technology to defend against those threats. Thanks. Thank you very much, Anna, for wonderful insights. And now our next uh, speaker will be Dr. Ben Nassi. Is he here? Yes. Dr. Ben Nassi from Ben Gurion University is a postdoctoral researcher researcher at Cornell Tech and an Urban Tech postdoctoral fellow. His research centers on investigation, the 
investigating the security and privacy implication of the interaction between systems and the physical world. Ben, the floor is yours. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, so thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I'm here to discuss about security and safety in the era of autonomous cars. And let's start. So hi, I'm Ben. Um, you should know uh, that uh, as part of my uh, daily work, I actually wear two hats. Uh, the first one is related to my uh, academic position as postdoc at Cornell Tech. I have a PhD in, in security and privacy from the Ben Gurion University of the Negev, and I ordered about 10 papers related to security and privacy issues of uh, autonomous vehicles, whether it's drones or cars. Uh, the second uh, hat that I wear is related uh, to the fact that I'm working a lot with the industry as consultant. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with threat analysis and risk assessment, I do it a lot with the automotive industry as part of the ISO regulations. Uh, that they are required to provide. Um, moreover, I'm a board member at Black Hat. Now, the reason that I've mentioned uh, these two specific hats that I wear uh, is because that the first part of this talk is uh, relied upon the work that I did in, uh, as part of my PhD, and the second part of the talk relies on the engagement I had with the industry as part of me being consultant for the last three years. Now, with that in mind, um, let me start by describing you my uh, uh, daily routine. I usually wake up early in the morning, take my son to the kindergarten, drive through a very uh, heavy traffic to work. Sometimes I pass uh, nearby a digital billboard. In other times, I pass nearby uh, an emergency vehicle that is parking uh, on the side of the road. And at the end of this long journey, I uh, get into the office and start to work. And probably this is the daily routine of the vast majority of you. Um, nothing here seems to be very special. Um, many of us encounter digital billboards and police cars uh, while driving from home to uh, work, um, we do not consider them spatial or interesting in any way. And this is true. As long as we are the one driving in the car, as long as we are the one who is responsible to steer the wheel. But as you know, we are about to enter the autonomous car era um, where Instead of being responsible for driving the car, we will be responsible to monitor uh, the driving. And in order to be able or to create the ability for cars to interpret the physical surroundings, algorithms and hardware, okay, sensors and basically software, were combined in uh, this specific structure in a few layers in order to be able to allow the car to interpret the physical surrounding, okay, in order to create uh, a virtual perception for the car. And I'm here to argue that there are significant differences uh, between humans and machines in terms of the way that we and machines interpret the, the physical surroundings. And just in order to visualize how significant is this difference, Please take a look on these two very interesting um, pictures that uh, were taken by me as part of the experiments that I did in uh, my PhD studies. On the left side, you can see uh, a projected picture of Elon Musk that I projected on the road. On the right side, you can see 
uh, a projection of uh, a speed limit that I projected on a tree. Um, all of the audience will consider it fake. No way you will consider it a real person or a real speed limit, right? But here are two very interesting facts. When I placed Tesla in front of the projection of Elon Musk, he detected it as a real person. Moreover, it stopped the car in order to avoid colliding with a deathless projected object, despite the fact that at least this specific uh, model contained a radar. Okay? It should have been detected the fact that this is a deathless projected uh, object, but it still stopped the car and treated it as a real person. And when I passed by uh, with my car, which was equipped with Mobileye 630, I was notified about a road sign that I should take into account, about the speed limit that I should take into account. Okay? I think that you can understand there is a great significance between the way that we interpret the physical surroundings and the way that um, cars or autonomous cars or even advanced driver assistance systems interpret the physical surroundings. And probably some of you are wondering how is that even related to cybersecurity. Now, with that in mind, I, I would like us to uh, return discussing about digital billboards. Um, digital billboards are used to present digital advertisement. They are located near primary roads, crossing intersections and highways. They face the internet. Okay, they have internet connectivity. You can easily find them on Shodan if you will look for them. And they are very unsecured, at least according to a few uh, talks that recently appeared at DEF CON at Black Hat. Basically, all of them concluded the same. They have about the same level of security as uh, an IP camera. An easy target for, for uh, hackers and attackers. Now, with that in mind, take a look on the next digital advertisement. It's a, a McDonald's ad advertisement. I just compromised a few frames of the McDonald's advertisement with a stop sign. You are about to see it. Okay? And I think you're already understand where, where I'm heading, uh, uh, to, uh, to which direction I'm trying to, uh, to take this, uh, this uh, talk. I took this um, advertisement, presented it on this TV screen that you can see on the left side. Okay? We simulated a digital billboard instead of hacking one. We do not hack uh, stuff. And engage Tesla's autopilot uh, to, in order to drive on this specific road, okay? As you can see, this digital advertisement uh, caused Tesla's autopilot to trigger the car to stop in the middle of the road despite the fact that there is no reasonable uh, reason to do so beyond this digital advertisement, okay? Um, as you can see, it is not an easy task to secure a car's perception against intentional attacks performed by attackers. Now, let's return discussing about emergency vehicles. I've mentioned them at the beginning. Emergency vehicles aren't something that we, should, that we consider as very special or interesting, but uh, amazingly or surprisingly, there are at least 60 known cases uh, in which Tesla crashed into emergency vehicles parking on the roadside, okay? Whether it was police cars, ambulances, or fire trucks. Moreover, in one specific case, the outcome was death, okay? It's not a game, it's reality. Someone died out of this unfortunate mistake. This actually triggered the NHTSA um, to start an investigation uh, about the reason that Tesla responds uh, or behaves in this way. And basically, to find the cause that Tesla collides with stationary emergency vehicles. And you know, I'm a researcher, so I research this area. This is something which well, I consider very, very interesting to me. So I took a car, and I took uh, a police siren, a police flasher, and I took two videos. The first video that you can see basically on top uh, is a, 10 second, 10 se a few seconds of a video with the flasher when the flasher is off. 
And the second video that you can see um, on the bottom, um, just a few seconds when the flasher is on. I took these videos and fed them to an object detector. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with object detectors, object detectors are basically artificial intelligence used to detect objects such as car, okay? They output um, the confidence regarding the detection of the car in this specific case. What you can see in here is pretty uh, interesting. When the flasher was off, there was a very steady confidence that this is a car which uh, was somewhere between 0 0.9 and 1.0, basically almost perfect confidence, okay? When the flasher was on, the entire confidence fluctuated between 0 0.9 and 0 0.2, below any reasonable threshold that is being used to determine whether this is, with this, to consider it as a car or not. Now, so far I've shown you um, an experiment that I did with a video camera and an object detector. I took it one step further and placed a Tesla in front of three cars where one of them uh, basically have a siren on top of it. Okay, uh, I want you to have a look on this video, take a look on Tesla's dashboard. You will see that the, for the vast majority of the time, only two cars are detected. In other times, only one car is detected and only uh, in very small portion of the time, three cars are detected. Now take a look on this um, video. This is Tesla dashboard. You can see how the third car is fluctuating. Now, it's, now only one car is detected, again two cars, three cars sometimes. You can see that sometimes as a result of this uh, flasher, which is not something that we consider very special, uh, this amazing vehicle misdetects other stationary vehicles in response. Again, it is not easy to secure a car's perception even against uh, the unintentional challenges. This is not an attack. This is just one of the challenges that autonomous vehicles are facing uh, every day. Now, interestingly, we do have great understanding on how to secure modern, car um, uh, modern cars using, uh, by deploying um, security mechanisms, okay? We know how to use network segregation in order to secure the CAN bus, the, the safety network uh, CAN bus from the internet. Uh, we know how, for example, to integrate the SECOC. Uh, we understand that we need to configure IP tables in order to avoid attackers from communicating with the car. We understand that encryption as well as authentication are important to secure the physical channels, whether they are Bluetooth, BLE, cellular, or even Wi-Fi. And some of the cars even use intrusion detection systems to detect anomalies in the behavior of the network. However, and this is um, a sentence that basically uh, my client always says, um, perception security is a weird bird. Uh, in Hebrew, we say of muzar. Um, none of the cybersecurity I've just mentioned uh, is useful to secure a car's perception. Okay, none of them. None of them will help you to secure the car against uh, what I've shown you against the digital billboards and against uh, the flasher that I've uh, showed you a few slides ago. Now, some of you probably think, and you may be, and, and argue that you can cross-validate detection using sensor fusion, and this is true, okay? Uh, many cars cross-validate detections um, by employing a sensor fusion approach, okay? Basically, what they do is they cross-validate data from one sensor with an additional sensor, okay, with the data of an additional sensor in order to detect, in order to basically create the virtual perception, okay? Now, for example, in, tes in uh, Tesla, uh, Tesla consists of radar, video cameras, and ultrasonic sensors, okay, at least the specific model that I use. Um, some more advanced uh, cars also integrate LiDAR to the system as well. So basically, they should have the capability needed in order to validate detection from one sensor with additional sensor. However, this is the most interesting, uh, I think, uh, insight I have regarding it. 
If you will examine the two most extreme approaches related to sensor fusion, you will find a very interesting trade-off, okay? One approach can be, for example, dismiss or ignore uh, any detection that wasn't identified by at least two different types of sensors, okay? Basically, for example, cross-validate the radar data with the video camera data. This may be good for security, okay? This specific projection that you can see in here is deathless, and I would expect uh, that if we will use a cross-validating uh, uh, cross uh, data, the radar uh, will uh, give an indication that there it's completely deathless, and as a result, it will be dismissed. But this is bad for security. Uh, this is bad for safety, not for security. It's good for security, it's bad for safety. And the reason is, um, what if we will accidentally misclassify a real person because it was only detected by one single uh, sensor? Now, the second most extreme approach is to consider any detection, okay? Even based on one single sensor. This as you can see, it's very bad for security. This specific projection will not be dismissed, okay? It will be considered despite the fact that this is a deathless projected image. However, this is good for safety. Uh, we will have a lower misclassific uh, misclassification rate of real objects. And here is the catch, okay? Security of perception reveals an interesting trade-off between security and safety, okay? We are used to think that by improving a car's security, we also improve its safety. This is not the case for security of perception, okay? You have a trade-off. Safety and security for perception are not located at the same side. Now, let us discuss about the current state. I'm about to wrap up this uh, presentation. Many of the attacks that presented so far um, against perception are still considered not practical and unrealistic by the industry, by the automotive industry. However, cyber attacks against cars were also considered not practical by the industry prior to 2015, okay? This unfortunate argument uh, was raised or by, by, uh, basically argued by the CEO of Daimler back then, okay? He claimed that uh, their cars are hacker-prone. In 2015, two amazing researchers named Charlie and Chris came to Black Hat and basically changed the industry perspective regarding cyber attacks by demonstrating, by demonstrating an end-to-end -end cyber attack against Jeep Cherokee, okay? This actually triggered a recall of 1.3 of million of Jeep Cherokees, okay? Um, the question whether attacks against a car perception will be considered a real threat by the industry uh, is yet to be answered in the near future. We still don't have the needed experience and data to understand whether they are, should be taken into account or not. Now, one uh, last thing. Bear in mind that there are many edge cases that require exploration in terms of safety and in terms of, sec of uh, security, okay? Uh, as you can see, Tesla identified uh, the moon as um, a traffic light in one case. In another case, an image uh, on an advertisement was detected as a real person and caused the, the, the staff to continuously trigger the brakes. And in another case, which became very viral on the internet, um, Burger uh, King uh, symbol was detected as a stop sign. And basically what you need to know is that we are somewhere in the middle, maybe even only in the beginning of, this, of discovering the real challenges that we need to consider. Um, and this will gonna be, at least to me, a very fascinating journey. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Ben. That was very interesting. Somehow I feel, somehow I feel like I want to have a hamburger for lunch. All right. So the next session is a panel about automotive cybersecurity, which we led by my dear friend, Mr. Chemi Pecker. <laughs> Chemi is a cyber strategy and artificial, artificial intelligence leader with over 30 years of experience in managing, developing, and designing strategies, methodologies, and processes for large scale and challenging architectures in the field of 
in the field of cyber warfare, cyber terrorism, cyber crime, cyber security, AI, and innovative technology. With Chemi, you are our, our distinguished guest, Shaya Fidman, Head of Information Security, Porsche Digital. Ronan Smalley, CEO at Argus Cybersecurity. Neta Lempert, CEO at Enigmatos. And, okay, okay. And Orit Lanzet, Chief Technology Strategy Officer at Simotive Technologies. Chemi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good morning and welcome all. My name is Femi Pecker and uh, the National Cyber Center for Smart Mobility Manager. And I'm happy to open uh, this panel with my dear colleagues this morning and to speak about the current and the near future challenges in the smart mobility and automotive arena. And everything that we saw and heard this uh, morning, it's only the beginning. We are going to have more and more from this one. And what we want to speak uh, this morning is to show what's happening in this revolution. We call it the fifth revolution, the fifth transportation revolution. I'm happy to say that uh, this year in 2023, my colleagues that are sitting here from the Ministry of Transportation, initiative by the government of Israel, and we launched this year the new National Cyber Center for a Cybersecurity Lab, a testing lab, an actual testing lab, which we are welcome and making the actual test for all the autonomous platform, vehicle, train, infrastructure, the smart one, the intelligent system, and to bring as a result to the government of Israel and making sure that it will be safe and secure when we are welcoming all this technology to Israel. So this is the new and the first year that we are doing it. The center is located in Be'er Sheva, and we are very happy and I'm very proud to have it. So for this morning, uh, you hear about the background of my colleagues, but let's say, Shaya or anybody, let's introduce yourself in one minute each and one of you, and we'll go to every the questions. I think one minute. Is it work? Yeah. I think one minute is too much. Uh, I'm Shaya, Head of Information Security of Porsche Digital. I uh, currently work together with uh, all of my team, part of them here with the red t-shirt, uh, to build up the first Israeli uh, cybersecurity center for Porsche. Ronen. My name is Ronen. I'm an Argus Cybersecurity CEO. We are doing uh, automotive cybersecurity, uh, intrusion detection in the car as well as systems outside the car to monitor fleets already deployed in millions of cars worldwide with many different brands. Hi everyone, my name is Urit Lanzet. Uh, I'm the uh, Chief uh, Technology and Strategy Officer in Simotiv. In Simotiv, uh, we both uh, develop solutions uh, and uh, perform the full life cycle and operational security activities. Uh, we develop solutions both in uh, detection and response. We have a VSOC, uh, fully operational. Um, we have um, solutions related also to security validation at the end of the tunnel and so on. Happy to be here. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Neta Lempert. I'm CEO of uh, Enigmatos. I'm doing cyber for the past 10 years or so. Started with cyber for video products. Now it's cyber for the automotive. We are also doing uh, in-vehicle detection systems. And we aim to have millions of customers like Argus has. <laughs> Ami. Good morning, I'm Ami Brown. Uh, as uh, Ben, I have multiple heads. But rele relevant for this meeting, I'm the CTO of Sites, uh, which mentioned earlier. Thank you, Ami. <laughs> well, we don't have so much time, so we'll deep dive right now and to try to cover some main things. So, Shai, I would like to start with you, please. I would like to see what is your opinion and how do the car manufacturer prepare to comply to the new regulation, everything that we are going to see. We do have the 155, 156. How we can apply and how is it in your perspective? So, as a... Um, Current effector, I will try to split my answer between two, um, as a current effector player and as Porsche. So I will start with 
as a carbon effector. Um, most of us are prepared pretty well to be compliant with the most of the cybersecurity compliance. So basically, we had enough time to do that. All of us, almost all of us, as a dedicated team to conduct some security uh, risk assessment and implement some security control, uh, controls that are relevant for us. Yes, we still have a lot of challenges regarding to the supply chain, which is a very complex, which is a very complex thing. But in, the, in a nutshell, we feel like um, comfortable enough uh, with the with the current with the current status. Um, one of the things that I want to mention as a Porsche, we we see our responsibility for our cars are a little bit more um, than just the regulation. Okay, for us, it's top priority to be. Um, safe, safe car, and of course, secure car, and we, we and we see ourselves um, that like a um, car manufacturer that need to create cars more secure than compliance required. So for us, it's on a top priority, and we are uh, taking it uh, really serious um, at ours at Porsche. Thank you, Shaya. Well, then, if you're going to take it to the other side, so how can we look about the new business of this one? How can we see everything is coming together when we have these new services, oriented vehicles? What can you share with us? Yeah, so uh, looking from the car industry perspective, we are at a very interesting stage with the software-defined vehicle evolving, and car manufacturers are looking for new rev revenue streams. We saw that Stellantis declared that they're aiming to have 30 billion euros as uh, revenue in 2030 uh, coming from services deployed in the car. Now, on top of complying with the regulations and deploying uh, intrusion detection systems to protect the cars, we also see new opportunities coming. Um, when we look at the car today, the car is becoming an extension of our homes. Actually, the consumers are looking at the holy triangle. The triangle is the home, the car, and the smartphone. And as people enter into the car, we see new risks, and with that, new opportunities. You know, when my son is stepping into the car, the first thing that he will do is will connect his smartphone to the car network with a cable. With that, perhaps some malicious application will try to download the contact list or get the car location. And, of course, this also brings an opportunity to provide additional service to the car. Of course, the car manufacturers, such as Porsche and others, uh, would like to provide the car as safe as possible because cybersecurity is becoming a safety issue if the car is being hacked. Yet, the environment is changing. Now we're taking the car, it is connecting to a charging station, and the threat evolves. In a recent uh, survey that we ran with Strategy Analytics, we found that more than 75% of people in the US and Europe are aware of the threat and concerned with their privacy. Somebody will open the microphone, will open the in-vehicle camera, and actually are willing to subscribe to such a service. So definitely we, we see new opportunities emerge, not only by protecting the car, but also together with the car manufacturers, providing services to the end users. Thank you, Len. Ami is serving as our CTO, site CTO, and Ami is meeting those challenging every morning, every day, trying to find some solution, making all the actual testing. Ami, what do you think about these challenges? I think that the while the complexity of the vehicle is increasing and the connectivity of the vehicle is increasing, uh, there are multiple standards that uh, try to, to uh, strengthen the security of the vehicle. But those standards define what needs to be done. There is no standard for how to test the vehicle, how to test the compliance of the vehicle to the standard. And this is one of the main challenges today, how to validate that the uh, standards were met how to validate that the vehicle is secure. Uh, and since we are dealing with moving target, because the vehicle is changing all the time because of new software, because we connect new system to the vehicle, to find a way to test the vehicle to ensure it's secure, it is a challenge which is not addressed yet. Thank you, Ami. Eta, you mentioned before that we do have a real problem with the aftermarket, uh, I would say, installation by the clients, private clients, when we are not sure that we have a real cybersecurity solution for this one after treatment. Yeah, so with all due respect to all of the efforts that the uh, car manufacturers uh, is putting through the, the car system and even more than beyond what the regulation uh, requires, 
there are still so many open holes, uh, and especially when it comes to off-the-market uh, components. So when we started, uh, mainly in Israel, since the, the you know, Ministry of Transportation in Israel is regulating very, very strictly the connectivity to the CAN bus, thank you, Kobe, for that, um, then we were under the assumption that no one is connecting to the CAN bus. But when we started going out and meeting customers, mainly in the U.S., we saw that everyone is connecting to the CAN bus left and right, meaning that all of the technology and efforts that were put in vehicles have less meaning when someone else is connected to the same data bus in the vehicle and can, can do other things that the car is not about to do. A week ago, exactly, a new bill was passed in the U.S. forces heavy vehicle, more than 10,000 pounds, pounds, to install automatic emergency braking. They will do it with visionary systems, cameras, as well as LIDAR or radars, and every truck will have to have these automated braking systems. They will have to connect to the CAN bus. So whatever the truck manufacturer applied on the vehicle that they released to the market is going to be changed now and is going to be much more vulnerable because those systems will be connected to the bus and no one is regulating the security level of those aftermarket components that will be installed. And that's a challenge. And that's a challenge that goes beyond what the car manufacturer has and someone needs to make sure that the car is protected throughout the lifetime of the vehicle and not just when it leaves the factory. And that's the challenge that we are trying to solve. We're still riding in those cars for the next three, five years. Well, even more than that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and, uh, uh, I forgot the name, doctor from uh, Ben Gurion. Now I'm very, very scared to go into my vehicle and I'm considering switching back to the Kia because Tesla kind of looks shaky these days. That's what I told you before regarding my colleague, the Tesla. So. Ah. <laughs> Saya, so as an OEM, on your point of view, as manufacturing, what is the real gaps that we have right now? So I will not repeat the answer that my colleague here uh, just, just addressed, but there is a lot of gaps, okay? Um, for me, for us, for as Porsche, the only gaps is like to deal with the real life uh, security threats, okay? Um, compliance means one thing, uh, but we also had, we also facing with a lot of other challenges, and this is one of the reasons why Porsche came to Israel because we want to work with um, with the all sta with the all Israeli startups who want to get the best talent here from um, from our amazing ecosystem and to make and to sorry and actually to to deal with the the real threats that we have today, which is far 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 above um, that we are addressed several years before. Yeah, thank you. Well, then how do you see it in your perspectives, those two things? Yeah, so uh, I think that it's true that uh, today the car manufacturers are aiming to reach the regulation. The next milestone is in July uh, 2024. But actually the big car manufacturers such as Porsche and, and others started preparing for the regulation even before it was announced in, in the summer of uh, 2020. But uh, obviously when we look at other car manufacturers and suppliers, the challenges are huge. So what we see now in the market, and we are working with over 100 suppliers and car manufacturers, we see that the car manufacturers were rushing to achieve the regulation, while their suppliers were left behind. What I mean to say by that, that each car manufacturer is working with tens and hundreds of suppliers. And for them, they do not have, some of them do not have the competence, some of them do not have the processes in place, Bear in mind that suppliers need to deploy CSMS, cybersecurity management system, uh, processes for threat and risk analysis, pen testing, and, and security processes. The regulation requires deployment both of detection inside the car, but also processes and systems outside the car. And now the, the suppliers are a bit clueless, and the uh, car manufacturers are, again, dealing with a huge challenge to work with their suppliers. The regulation requires deployment of cybersecurity throughout the entire supply chain. So uh, this is the challenge that we see now in the market, and uh, car manufacturers are starting to engage and help their suppliers in order to achieve the type of approval, which is, again, the, the next milestone is just around the corner. Thank you, Ronen. Orit, in your eyes, motive. you already did so, so many years. How does it look from your eyes? 
Um, yes, yeah, so I wanted actually to uh, refer a little bit um, also to the autonomous uh, challenges. Uh, we are working with uh, several uh, more mature and innovative clients uh, on their platforms that they are preparing, and uh, we see uh, several issues uh, that extend the current issues um, in the normal uh, platforms that we work on today. Um, so from one side, uh, talking about everything related to control in the vehicle, the control functions, and for sure the security controls, um, like we already saw today, uh, the sensor authenticity, um, authentic computation of the, gro of the road graph that you saw a little bit today, um, the robustness of the algorithms. As, mo as more as the algorithms are more complex, actually we need to make them more robust because they make so many decisions and they have such uh, vast implications that they must be robust in the security side of things. These are things we are working on today. Um, one very interesting point in the control regard is um, we are never going to uh, just solve all the problems. We are going to have attacks, we are going to have issues, and we need to find a, a, a safe, a redundant uh, way to return to a safe state by the vehicle. So um, if we today have some let's say early stage response algorithms also in platforms, these need to be very mature um, so that the vehicle can uh, maintain the control, uh, the navigation and the guidance after an incident. These are a few challenges um, that we see. Um, in regards to the navigation and the guidance, um, we have the issue of reliable positioning data and managing data in general that comes from the swarm information um, in the smart uh, everything um, relation. Um, and basically, it's like the challenge that we have today, but it's, um, it's double-fold because more data is going to come. So freshness, authenticity, and correctness of the data also requires um, much stronger computation uh, support from the components in the vehicle, um, not to talk even and extend it to the privacy of the data because more data of pedestrians might be exposed of vehicles on the road and so on. Um, and thirdly, um, another aspect that we are uh, discussing, of course, as we do today, is the fleet operation and the dispatch. Um, and one specific point about that uh, is what uh, a not very popular name, but it's used, is the kill switch. Uh, <laughs> or the uh, ability to remote control override the vehicle that got out of control. So these are a few challenges, very difficult ones that we are looking at today. Completely agree. Thank you very much. Neta, you mentioned before that we need to have some solution in the, in the eyes of Anigmatos. What would you see, because we are going to drive it for the next three, five years, these coming cars that we have right now, which solution you can see? So I think that uh, my biggest concern uh, relates to the cars that are already driving on the roads today. Because autonomous vehicles is, is something which are, are really afraid of because of the complexity of the technology and the different risks. Uh, and there's nothing to add uh, more than uh, Urite mentioned here. But we still have 1.4 billion vehicles on the roads today. You know, there is a study, I, I don't recall, uh, some institution from Atlanta said that if you disable six vehicles in Manhattan, you cause a gridlock. The entire city shuts down. Only six vehicles in Manhattan. Imagine what will happen if you tackle more than that in different cities. So the risk that we're facing, in, in my opinion, currently the, the, more, the more urgent risk is the current vehicles that are driving on the roads today. Because even if new cars, starting July 22 or even July 24, as Renan said, will be perfectly protected, we still have the risk of those cars that are driving in the car for five years, six years, 10 years or so, especially when it involves heavy vehicles such as trucks. If you disable the brakes on the trucks, if it carries chemicals, or if it's a bus without brakes, you, we all remember the, the movie Speed with Keanu Reeves. This is dangerous. This is scary. So even though cyber has lots of colors and shades, and it's like an onion, lots of layers, what we're trying to deal with is the current threat and risks on existing cars that drives on the roads and the next one that will come on the roads in the very near future. Um, it's not that we ignore the, the future that is coming to be, but we think that we need to deal right away with whatever we are dealing with these days. Once we finish with that and reduce the risk to the minimum possible, then we will be allowed to deal with future steps or let other people do other things.
Thank you, Neta. Since it's, it's all coming and starting uh, from the OEMs, Shaya, can you tell us, please, if the responsibility, the strategy, the methodology in the OEMs, can you see it's coming together from A to Z, very, very accurate, very, very smoothly, all the process, everything. Are we going to meet those challenges? So, um, mainly, we are implemented our cybersecurity um, context for our connected cars. It's, it's something that we're trying to deal with really, really carefully because um, it's based on the, our capabilities to identify our own uh, threats, okay? So this is one of the reasons why we are running our own red team, our own research, research activities to be able to identify all the lakes and all, um, if, um, and all visibility lakes that we have um, and find another potential, another potential threat, sorry. Um, to be one of the, those OEM that uh, making decisions and make those processes by evidence um, by evidence based decisions it's something that's quite new in our industry but this is why we are trying to this is why we are trying to um, to go in that direction we see we understand the old gaps that that our colleagues are are just uh, just mentioned and we see ourselves as more than just responsible for um, be compliant. We, we, we really see security and, um, and the safety of our cars in, in our top priority as being mentioned before. And in addition to the, um, to the working together with our strong partners, the, the startups here, our, the, rest of, uh, the rest of our team, we see um, we're taking it pretty serious and we want to be on um you know on a top level of uh, of um, uh, of the industry to be the market leader so if one of you are want to take a part of the journey journey just talk to our people with the red uh, t-shirt and join us because we are hiring like like a crazy <laughs> thank you there is a lot of challenges then do you see it in the other OEMs that you're familiar with so i think that uh, Porsche is one of the most advanced uh, OEMs no doubt and uh, of course, their cars are most secure. Th this is actually the point where the OEMs have two main challenges. One is complying with the regulation, but also keeping their cars secure with the connectivity, electrification, and the other uh, evolving technologies. I think that uh, Porsche by itself has a, a unique challenge because typically the Porsche cars last on the road for longer. We see Porsche cars for 20, 30 years on the road, and their car owners also would like to keep it for a long time with them. They're not discard them. So the challenge of keeping the car, especially with all the advanced technologies, are emerging. When we look at the regulation, the regulation also requires a maintenance for 10 to 15 years, which again becomes a challenge to the car manufacturers, because once you deliver the car to the car owner, it's not in your possession, but you still need to maintain it from cybersecurity standpoint. And that also introduces new business challenges. Car manufacturers, by definition, are hardware manufacturers. The car is a hardware product. Now, how do you switch to start licensing and buying software? When we deal with purchasers at the car manufacturers, we see that some of them are used to buy only hardware. Now they need to start buying software. What is license? Do you pay one time? Do you pay subscription? Of course, when it comes to cybersecurity, the threat landscape keep evolving. We mentioned 20 to 30 years. We cannot predict what will be the case in five to 10 years. Actually, we are working today on programs, on projects for cars that will hit the road in 27, 28. We cannot predict what will be the threat landscape. And with that, also the commercial challenges. What type of contract do we sign with the OEMs? But I think the industry is heading that way, and we work closely with the OEMs, with their even purchasing department. Sometimes you give training to these guys. How, what are the business models? How do we work with them? And I think this is something that I really like about the automotive industry. It acts as a community. So sharing information, especially at these times, is, is very critical to protect the cars. Thank you, Olen. We need to start summarizing. So Ami and Uit, last comments from your side? I think the OEMs has, uh, have a great uh, responsibility, but they cannot be the only uh, uh, solution. Uh, we have to start think about the security of vehicles about uh, a bit different 
uh, because we need to see, to look at the picture from a, a, a higher perspective. Uh, as uh, uh, Neta said, uh, six vehicles can uh, block Manhattan. Consider the situation when there is uh, uh, 20 vehicles that will stop in uh, Dizengoff in Tel Aviv and there is uh, a, a bump uh, uh, in, in that uh, road. What will happen? Uh, so scenarios can be more complicated than just the vehicle. Uh, scenarios can be more uh, com complex than that. Uh, we need to take in consideration that attack scenarios will happen anyway, whatever we'll do. Uh, and I think about the situation where my uh, grandpa uh, is uh, uh, driving the car uh, and raises an attack against that vehicle. What can she do? Nothing. So we need to think about a way to support vehicles on the road, to monitor them and to intervene in case of cyber incident. It's to think about the transportation market totally different. Thank you, Ami. Wait. Um, yes, so I think uh, if we look at the vast uh, majority of what we discussed today, we see two main axles in which we focus. So one is um, um, making sure that we have um, secure uh, development process uh, and artifacts when we design, and then making sure we are flexible enough and uh, following up on, our, on the threats that are relevant in real life in order to handle them and react on them uh, on time. Um, and I think both of these challenges present also new business opportunities. Um, for the development side, it's not only about uh, reviewing any more risk, uh, manage, uh, the risk uh, situation and so on. It's also about supporting the developers because the companies we see, they're ramping up their development force. It's not like before just uh, buying stuff. It, they create the, themselves the software. And uh, sec de DevOps, uh, I think, is a very important word now. So to support the developers in, from the beginning, creating a more secure software, but then having all of the operational knowledge um, how to uh, deal with threats when they come to the table. Thank you so much. Neta. Yeah, I just, I just want to add. First of all, uh, Porsche in particular is at a lower risk because the car is driving so quickly, so the availability <laughs> window is very, very short. But I want to address a different thing. I mean, everybody here is aware of the risk of cybersecurity and automation, and automotive, sorry. However, when I meet lots of end users, customers, fleet managers, they are not aware of the risk. And I think that as a society, if I may say so, we need to increase the awareness of those end users. You know, Ronan just said that, you know, uh, personal, pe you know, people are aware of cybersecurity threats and they will be able to, uh, they will be willing to pay a subscription. Um, from the very short uh, few rounds uh, meeting with customers, I was seeing the awareness level as very, very low. I identified that nobody really identified the risk. So if we, as an industry, can increase awareness, yeah, we will take care of the you know, technical sides and technology and regulations, but if fleet managers or drivers are not aware of the risk, they will not pay for it. So as an industry, we need to increase awareness, do marketing activities to increase the awareness so people will be interested in buying those solutions. Thank you, Neta. One, two questions from the audience? Yes, please. So we do not work directly with OEMs. So unlike my colleagues here, which I respect deeply, um, we are not involved in what the OEM is offering. But you mentioned IoT. And again, in my last trip to the US a couple of weeks ago, I had to drive, drive from Kansas City to Dallas. It's a seven and a half hours drive with, with no stop. Four hours out of that seven and a half, I had no cellular coverage. So those IoT devices that needs to be constantly connected to the internet were not connected. And this is a big 
risk. So it makes, made us rethink, you know, cur currently our technology do everything in the cloud. And right now we're considering to move some of the processes to, to be done on the vehicle, on the device itself, because of lack of coverage. Again, Israel is a very small country. We have the best cellular coverage worldwide. And in many other countries, cellular coverage is not good enough. So IoT devices or remote managed uh, vehicles can have issues when, when you go out of coverage. Thank you, Neta. We're out of time. Okay, sorry. Thank you, thank you very much. You Hope you enjoyed. Exactly. We can still talk. So thank you very much, my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Chemi. Great talk. Thank you. All right. He was on stage already. His name is All right. Wait, wait. For the last lecture and special demonstration before the coffee break and snacks, I'd like to invite to the stage Mr. Ami Brown. Ami, I'm a city of sites and one of the uh, most busiest and most respected technology experts in Israel. Ami, please. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, uh, today. I'll skip the introduction because it was introduced so many times this morning, uh, and a bit about what we are going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to describe a bit the modern vehicle and the challenges with uh, uh, a growing attack surface of, growing of uh, modern vehicles, how it can affect the uh, autonomous vehicle, uh, and I, in the end, I'm going to, gi to show an, some example of a simple kind of attack and how it can influence the, uh, in the wider perspective. So we're adding new technologies to the modern vehicles, uh, telematics technologies that will allow us to uh, remotely control the vehicle, to lock it, to start it, to start the air condition, things like that. Uh, by that, we are opening the vehicle to remote uh, uh, operation. We are adding new technologies to support the, dr the driver from navigation to uh, augmented visibility to improve the, the capability of the driver to, to identify obstacles and uh, uh, problems in the road. We are adding new automation capabilities to the, to the vehicle, uh, uh, especially when we're dealing with uh, uh, electric vehicles and uh, the capability to or manage effectively the, uh, the charging of the vehicle. And we would like to entertain myself while, while we are driving, so we're adding new uh, 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 entertainment capabilities to the vehicle. We are connecting the phone to the vehicle and so on. Because of that, the vehicles become very complicated, complicated very complex uh, systems. Actually, today, there are uh, hundreds of different uh, uh, controllers, uh, uh, even computers uh, in the vehicle. All of them are connected in various uh, networks, in multiple protocols in the networks. Uh, uh, and if we look from the, from the financial perspective, we can see that the part of the electronics in the vehicle becoming half of the price of the vehicle, half of the cost of the vehicle. Uh, and this is not included the uh, electric uh, uh, engine or the battery, which are a significant cost by themselves, and they are electronics as well. Uh, so actually, the vehicle become a computer on wheels. Uh, and this is something that we need to, to understand. We spoke about, uh, a lot in the previous discussions about the safety, but when you're dealing with cybersecurity of vehicles, we have multiple concerns. Safety is the most important one, but this is not the only one. The availability of the vehicle is another concern that we need to, to think about. When I'll come in the morning to my vehicle and design it start, it's not an issue of safety, it's availability. 
and there are many other aspects in which I can affect the availability of the vehicle. Think about the comfort. I'm going out to my vehicle, today it's 30 degrees and the air condition doesn't work. It's a comfort. I can control the vehicle remotely to disconnect the, the air condition. And there are many other aspects of the comfort that can affect the driver. Eventually, those comfort issues can affect the, the safety of the vehicle in, in, in addition to that. And there is the issue of privacy. There are a lot of sensors in the vehicle. Some of them are monitoring what is happening inside the vehicle. Some of them are monitoring what is happening in the surrounding of the vehicle. All this data can expose us to privacy issues. All those uh, 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 feeds of data can be very dangerous in the wrong hands. All those are issues that we need to address when you're dealing with a cyber vehicle cybersecurity. Adding to that, that the complexity of the vehicles is uh, growing, uh, and the complexity of the systems is growing, the connectivity, the autonomous capabilities, those make the vehicle very complex. Adding to that the fact that we have systems which are coming from multiple different vendors, each one of them with its own development processes, its own agenda, its own protocols, all that have to be crafted together in the vehicle. It's a very complex scenario to build it as a, a whole solution to make it secure. And because of that, the attack surface of modern vehicle is increasing, increasing dramatically. Uh, we can see now that the modern vehicle is connected to the world in multiple different uh, technologies, multiple uh, channels. Some of them are just can, can used only for uh, uh, getting information to the vehicle. Some of them are bi-directional uh, connections. Uh, even the simple connection of a radio, and today in many vehicles there is a satellite radio, which is actually an IP connection of the vehicle to somewhere which we don't control. This channel connects the vehicle to the world. It can get malicious content that will be deployed in the vehicle without our knowledge. So the attack surface is growing, and we have limited control of that attack surface. The drivers for this complex uh, attack surface can be the multiple vendors ecosystem. In a, one vehicle, there are multiple hundreds of even uh, vendors. Each one of them provide pieces of technology. The same vehicle can be in, in multiple configurations. Each one of them with these different vendors that supply the, the, uh, uh, the systems. Not all those systems were tested together to make sure that they are operate in the right way together. In the vehicle, we have multiple networks, multiple network protocols. Not all of them are secure in the same way, and they are connected. So I can use those connections to create leverage and to get access to sensitive system in the vehicle. We have unsecured protocols, some of them with no authentication, with no uh, encryption, with no even basic security capabilities. Those uh, protocols are connected together to the most sensitive system in the vehicle. We have unsecured interfaces, as we said, radio connection, UHF and VHF connection to the vehicle, and many other interfaces which most of them are not as secure as uh, they should be. The solution that the industry was built to those challenges is standards, and today there are multiple standards that aim to improve the security of the vehicle. Uh, there is the ISO 21434, uh, uh, the UNR 155, and many, many others, and any aspect of the vehicle uh, think that there are some standards that are improving its security. But those standards define 
set of uh, uh, threats and self-mitigations. They defined how to build compliance, but they don't define anything about how to test it, how to make sure that the uh, uh, standard was actually uh, met. There is no standard to define how we are testing a vehicle, how we make sure that all those standards are covering all the aspects of the vehicle. Maybe ISO 21434 is the most closest, close in that area, but it's not enough as well. In the absence of those standards, it is very hard to build a holistic approach, uh, one standard in which we can evaluate the level of security of, uh, of vehicles. And this is without getting to the challenge of autonomous vehicles. When we're dealing with, autonom with autonomous vehicles, we have multiple levels of uh, 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 autonomous. Uh, actually, we are starting to discuss about autonomous vehicles from level two, in which there are some uh, assisting capabilities to the driver, like uh, uh, um, uh, uh, adaptive uh, uh, cruise control, uh, uh, the lane uh, ma management, and so on. But as we move upper in the stream of uh, 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 autonomous, the uh, capabilities of the vehicle to operate itself is uh, growing. The capability of the driver to intervene is uh, uh, reducing. And uh, uh, this is something that put us in very uh, uh, interesting situation, as my colleague Ule said earlier. When you talk about autonomous vehicle, we have to remember that it is not a one system. It's a much more complicated scenario. We have the base vehicle that can be vehicle that will come from any manufacturer. Uh, some of the uh, uh, autonomous vehicle providers use uh, 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 Toyota vehicles uh, in Israel, Toyota or uh, 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 um, uh, uh, Hyundai vehicles and many, and many other uh, vehicles. The base vehicle was probably tested and developed by one manufacturer. But on top of that, the autonomous vehicle provider uh, built the uh, autonomous vehicle system, which is an add-on to the vehicle. This add-on was not tested with the standards for the, of the vehicle. It is a totally different system. It's connected to the vehicle. It takes control of the vehicle, but it's a separated system. And this autonomous system, uh, autonomous vehicle system, is not operating by itself. It's connected, in most cases, to a command and control system or a fleet management system or other system that manage multiple vehicles in parallel. And this system connects to other systems for a billing, for a, a vehicle a, a allocation, for a, a, a optimization of the routes, and, and so on. And this is an ecosystem, but all connected to the vehicle. There are multiple attack vectors against that stack of uh, uh, autonomous vehicle. These all the attack vectors that can affect the vehicle itself. We can find attack vectors that can impact the connection between the vehicle and the autonomous a, a vehicle system. We can attack the autonomous vehicle system by itself. There are attack vectors that can impact the connection between the autonomous vehicle system to the management system, and of course the management system, which is basically an IT system that can be uh, attacked in various ways. Only the level of the vehicle itself is covered by the existing standards. And those standards are not enough. So the gap is quite significant uh, uh, in this uh, uh, area, uh, and this is not covered by anyone. I want to give you a very simple example that will show, I believe, how a, a, we can use very simple attack to impact part of the ecosystem. And as we know, the strength of the chain is uh, relying on the, is actually derived from the, uh, uh, from the strength of the weakest uh, link in the chain. 
And the example I want to use is uh, a, a controller of a, a part of the system we, we call TPMS. This is the tire pressure monitor, monitoring system. This kind of system is available uh, in most of the modern vehicles. Actually, I think it's mandatory from all the uh, old vehicles from 2017. Uh, this is based on sensor that is deployed on each uh, tire, on each uh, uh, wheel of the vehicle. Uh, and the, the idea is to analyze and to detect when there is a loss of pressure in the tire and generate an alert. The uh, TPMS system is based on transmission between the vehicle to the, between the tire to the vehicle on a UHF channel. Very simple UHF channel, 450 MHz, more or less. To intercept the TPMS, we need very simple equipment. Actually, we can do the interception with a $20 RTL uh, SDR receiver. This one, I can transmit to the vehicle with this device, HECRF, it's $250 device, the SDR transceiver. The software I need for that kind of attack is an open source so software I can download from the internet, very simple software. And if we look a bit to the technology, the structure of the packet that the tire is sending to the vehicle is very simple. Very simple packet with the information about the ID of the, of the tire, the pressure and the temperature. What we can see, and this is the spectrum analysis of the transmission between the tire to the vehicle. What we can see is that there is a cyclic, a cyclic transmission between the tire to the vehicle. What interesting is what is not there. There is no encryption. No authentication, and the tire ID is a static ID. So there is no really any way to verify that the information I got is really coming from the tire. So if we take a very simple scenario, and I took here the uh, uh, Hadid tunnel in Road 6, I'll deploy the receiver in the entrance to the tunnel. I will collect information about, from, about vehicles. I will identify the ID of the tires of multiple vehicles that are getting into the tunnel. I will deploy the transceiver on the other side of the tunnel. And I will start to transmit fake data, fake packets to the vehicles which are getting out of the, uh, out of the tunnel. The potential impact. Three scenarios. The simple scenario, one vehicle. One vehicle was, was uh, uh, affected. He got an alert of flat tire. Most likely, the driver will pull aside, will get out of the car to see what is happening. He will see that nothing really happened, get into, in, back into the car and move away. But what if it will be 100 vehicles? What will happen in the road? What are the potential that accident will happen by that? And this is when we're talking about vehicles with drivers in the vehicle. Now consider what will happen in case of autonomous vehicles. No one really knows what will happen. No one, especially if those vehicles are coming from multiple different systems. Just to make it clear, this scenario was simplified in order for, for this discussion. The uh, actual scenario is a bit more complex, a bit more challenging, but the technology is the same as I described here. Uh, more complex scenarios like that can use the attack against the TPMS system in order to get into the other systems of the vehicle because I have non-secure radio connection to the vehicle. I'm getting into the network of the vehicles full radio, non-secure radio. So the potential is exists. There are capabilities to compensate for such an attack. For example, by connecting the uh, uh, TPMS system to the ABS, to the braking, automatic braking system, to, to monitor if there are changes in rotation of the, uh, between the wheels, and that allow me to understand if there is real flat tire or not. But 
those type of compensation solutions uh, will increase the attack, the attack surface because I'm making integration between ECUs, between components which should not be connected. So I'm extending the attack surface. We need to find the right balance how to do it. To conclude, the vehicle cybersecurity is a multidisciplinary challenge. We have to understand the vehicle, we have to understand software, we have to understand radio, we have to understand a lot of things together in order to really understand how to improve the security of a vehicle. The standards that exist today are not enough. And we have to build new methodologies of how to test, how to validate that the security of a vehicle, the security of a system of vehicles, is really exists, is really as we plan it to be. This is what we do in sites. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ami. This was awesome. Now we're going to take 15 minutes break for coffee and snacks. And when we get back, we're going to talk about rail tech security, aviation security, and many more fascinating uh, things. So see you soon. All right, let's begin. Please take your seats. So our next speaker is Mr. Shao Fei Hang. Group CISO at Smart, or SMRT Corporation. Xiao Fei is a distinguished cybersecurity professional with over 24 years of experience in both public and private sectors. Today, Xiao Fei will talk about what most get wrong about managing OT cybersecurity. Mr. Hang, stage is yours. Thank you for the applause. And how's everyone doing? I think we lost half the crowd after the break, but uh, all's good. Um, I have a, a story. Before I maybe even start talking about OT cybersecurity, kind of a dry topic, right? Uh, I have a quick story to share about Tel Aviv and my experience here this week. So I was trying to get to the university on Monday, and uh, I checked on Google Maps. It says 15 minutes from a hotel, which is uh, around the beach. So I decided to get a get. Uh, you know, the, the Uber equivalent in, in Tel Aviv, and he said 19 minutes. Okay, fair enough. The taxi was 800 meters away. I said, but why 19 minutes? I can rush faster than that in 19 minutes. And guess what? The taxi arrived in four minutes. Um, and that wasn't the end of the story. So um, traffic here is horrible. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and basically that, that's how I wanted to start the talk, right? Um, yeah. Just wanted to rant about, about, about uh, introduction about myself. I'm the group CISO at the SMRT Corporation, um, the largest public transportation provider in Singapore. We run the trains, the buses, the taxis, and uh, everything that moves. No. Um, prior to joining SMRT Corporation, I was actually the, the regulator uh, in the government. I was a PTA, the Public Transport Authority. Um, and kind of like I'm eating the, my own dog food right now. I set out the policies and now I have to comply with the policies that I have written, um, including those uh, legislation in the Cybersecurity Act that were relevant to the transportation industry. And I'm also an advisor to Silas uh, since November 22. So shout out to all those of you who are from Silas. Hello. <laughs> Okay. Um, so apart from, the, from my daytime job, which pays me salary, I do a lot of uh, work that doesn't pay any money. I'm a guest lecturer for the Nanyang Technology University um, School of International Studies, blah, blah, blah. And uh, you can read. Uh, I, I mean, if, if you like, you can actually follow me on LinkedIn. I post a lot of crap uh, and you know, uh, stories on LinkedIn about my, my journeys in Tel Aviv. Also. So operational technology. So um, when I, I mean, the topic of the talk is like what most get wrong about OT cybersecurity, right? Uh, I, I hope the most doesn't refer to you because you guys are here in Cyber Week, so obviously you know something about cybersecurity or interested in cybersecurity. But when I talk a lot about OT cybersecurity to people who are not in cybersecurity, they, they think about the first thing is, oh, it's about legacy systems, right? And the switch in their mind thinks about Windows XP, which is the screen you see here, right? Oh no, that's bad. It's Windows XP. It's known that Microsoft no longer supports it. We're gone. It's a disaster, right? But 
that's not really it, because OT cybersecurity is more than just Windows. How many, I mean, again, another quick story. So uh, I was planning my flight to Tel Aviv um, pretty late, two weeks ago, and all the flights were all booked out. So I wanted to find a flight with two criteria. Number one, it must be cheap. Yeah, not a lot of budget. Second is I have to do a layover, and I want to find a flight that has as little layover as possible so that I can catch some sleep when I landed in Tel Aviv. So I found one flight which is one hour layover. One hour. Um, so when I, I plan and think, I, I, I thought in my mind this was the best plan ever, right? And uh, operationally, I was ready. Packed my bags, went to the airport, and hopped onto the flight. And when I reached the layover destination, guess what happened? This happened. We were, you know when the lights go out and everybody starts standing up and taking their luggage? Why? <laughs> Why? The cabin doors are not even open yet, but never mind. So I stood there and waited. And guess what? I was stuck there for 15 minutes because somebody was like taking the, old, the longest time to take down the luggage and whatnot, and I was sitting right at the back. And this really is why many people get wrong about OT cyber. It's not really about cybersecurity at all. It's about providing a level of service. It's providing a level of outcome that you expect from the operations, right? Whether it's on a plane, a car, a train, whatsoever, you want to get to the destination as fast as possible, as seamlessly as possible. And this thing happens, it's not expected. And that is why when I talk about gaps in OT cybersecurity, number one is that when we talk about cybersecurity to the IT guys, right, to my fellow CISOs, no offense, um, they often get the what could go wrong question wrong, right? If you ask an IT person what could go wrong, oh, it could blue screen, you could get hacked, you could land yourself in um, the CrowdStrike, whatever, a track hard database and so on. No, the answer is no, right? For engineering systems, the most important thing is safety. You do not want people to get killed. You don't want people to get injured. And that's what could go wrong. And if you take a compliance-oriented approach, checking the boxes against the policies that for example, I wrote, right, it doesn't mean that you're secure. It doesn't mean you're secure. And you start to implement irrelevant controls and measures in your system, in your solution. You think that OT network is like your IT network. Implement firewalls, IDS, IPS, and what else, right? But do they really serve the purpose of actually ensuring that everything is safe? Not really. You end up with a, like a spaghetti. I'm talking about, I'll talk about spaghetti later on as well. Secondly, incapability. Uh, again, it's a very strong word, but a lot of the companies around the world, not just in Singapore, we rely excessively on technology and vendors. We think the technology is the panacea to all our problems, right? Compliance, technology, and therefore we are safe. And when things happen, right, when the S word hits the fan, and the CISO looks around, nobody raises their hand, and there's no domain experts who understand what this system is supposed to do. Um, I think we should check with the engineers, right? And the engineer says that, oh, I'm new to the company, I don't run this particular system. Right? Very familiar for people who are in railways because it's so complex. And thirdly is that when things happen, I'm going to talk about that later, they don't happen just singularly. Things happen all at once. Okay, I'm going to talk that about especially bad things. Number three, readiness. I always talk about readiness is that when you want to fight a war, you better make sure you have trained to fight the war Right? But a lot of things, a combination of number one and number two, which I mentioned earlier on, you don't have each, uh, sufficient backup and recovery plans. I'm not talking about ITDR. When you talk to a CISO in the IT space, oh, our RPO is fine, our RTO is perfect, right? Take this to an engineering system, it's irrelevant. Data is just a means to an end. What matters most is that the commuters in my business they do not want to stand at the platform waiting for the train and when everything is like, we'll be back shortly, right? Half an hour later, we'll be back shortly and you know, it continues. And I think it really goes down to the point about cybersecurity being misaligned with the business objectives. What, who are we trying to serve? What are we trying to provide as a service? The next thing is that OT cybersecurity is not a linear function. What do I mean? Um, for the mathematical geeks here, right, I'm a geek, so it's, it's basically y equals ax plus b, right? There's a single variable. Something happens, 
a fixed outcome comes out. But that doesn't happen in cybersecurity, and I like to use a, a bow tie model for those of you who are familiar with uh, the V cycle and bow tie model. Kudos to you. So bow tie model is actually a very interesting model because it actually shows that it's actually a circular motion where you anticipate risk, you try to withstand the risk, adapt, but you also need to respond and it fits back to the cycle. Now, there's a whole lot of things to actually digest, right? But focus your eyes on the eyeballs on the right side where the crisis happens. This disrupts the whole cycle, okay? And it's like spaghetti. Yeah, I hope it, well, it works. Perfect. I was trying this out so many times. Um, how many of you know this? When you try to break a spaghetti, it actually doesn't break in two. It breaks in three. You don't believe me, you watch. That's why I have to put, put up the video up so you believe me. It's very interesting, right? So I actually tried at home. I broke a lot of spaghetti and my wife was like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> I'm just trying to validate. Somebody said trust but verify, right? Yeah, I verify. So, um, yeah. So what does broken spaghetti got to do with OT cybersecurity? I was saying that I was going to talk about cyber uh, spaghetti, right? Because it's a mess. Cybersecurity is a huge mess today. And I, I, I mean it because when things happen, when a, some, a, cyber incident, a cyber event happens in an OT system, in a railway system, in a transportation system, bus system, whatsoever, right? It, um, there are many things that happen and you are, the last cyber, it doesn't come across as being cyber related right at the get-go, right? And when you ask the CISO or the security team, are we okay? Is this incident related to cyber? Oh, we have all these preventive controls in place. We have uh, Palo Alto, CrowdStrike, whatever, yeah, and we're all good. But the threats have evolved, not three years ago, not one year ago. The threats have evolved even in the last 24 hours. Again, if you follow my LinkedIn, I post a lot about the threats. I'm like a live threat intel feeder. But the thing is that we know that the threats are changing, and what do we do? As a cybersecurity professional, we put in blocks after blocks after blocks of reactive controls. And we call this our disaster recovery plan. We pride ourselves by running tabletop exercises, drills every year. We go to cyber rangers and we convince ourselves that we are prepared to react when a cyber event happens. But it's not. Because if you look at the right hand, right -hand side, there are so many other consequences that actually can filter back, funnel back to what might be a cyber security. You do not know who to respond, how to respond. You need visibility. Okay? And that's where the next uh, slide here comes in, the CISA in the US. Uh, I, I kind of like, again, full disclosure, I took it from them. Uh, the link is over there. But it's very interesting because when you look at the cyber risk, the consequences, it's not just transportation. Right? A lot of these actors, as the first speaker pointed out, these guys are not just looking at your company alone. They are looking at other, actor, other companies as well, perhaps in your country. And that's kind of the adversary that we are dealing with. And that is why, when we talk about the weakest link in OT cybersecurity, again, this, uh, I don't mean to insult the, the CISOs or the IT security folks in the room, right? We always say, human, we always say that humans are the weakest link. We spend lots of money on security awareness, training, and so on. I, I'm not saying that it doesn't work, but in an OT world, the humans are not the weakest link. The weakest link is actually the spaghetti. They are all interconnected to so many places around the network, right? They need to be properly organized. How do you organize and manage it? You need to have visibility. You need to achieve the desired outcome, which is your business outcome. You need to have all the necessary ingredients in place to cook a proper bowl of spaghetti, okay? Otherwise, the entire system could fail. So real quick, right? I just wanted to, um, if you think about, I, I don't want these 15 minutes to be a waste of your time as well, right? So the first thing when you talk about OT cybersecurity, what most get wrong, again, it doesn't refer to you in the room, you're here. Um, it requires working backwards from desired outcomes of the system, right? And it's, it sometimes doesn't mean that bringing up the system will solve the problem. For example, I, I'll give you an example. When an incident happened in, in, uh, some sometime, sometime back, right, when I was the regulator, um, that was during the WannaCry ransomware. You know, you, if, if you guys uh, were, were uh, dealing with ransomware to the WannaCry, what happened was that um, it was a very knee-jerk reaction. The regulator, again, my regulator, said that you need to implement the patch within the next 24 hours. So being a responsible uh, authority, we told the reg to talk to operators, please implement the patch, this uh, critical patch, implement it in 24 hours. And you know what happened the next day? A disruption happened, a real, a real, real disruption happened, but it wasn't cyber-related at first glance. It came out in the papers. 
Um, but later on, 24 hours later, I, I found out that actually it was because of the security patch that we had directed the operator to implement. So we really need to think about OT cybersecurity from the outcomes. Don't just patch blindly. The second thing is a system of system approach to OT is critical to success. Right? Don't think of one system or two systems. You need to think of a system of systems approach. And this includes the connections, the pipes, the, 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 the networks that are connecting all these, stitching all these systems together. And I call this the blast radius. What does the blast radius mean? It means that if somebody um, you know, spills, let's say, a, a, mil a cup of gla a glass of milk on the table, it just doesn't stop in one place, right? It starts to spill over to all the other connected systems. And it doesn't just affect the next system or the next system. It affects all the conduits that are in between. And this is very important today because why? We have Wi-Fi, we have RFID, we have Bluetooth, and all these are connections that we need to secure. But if you talk about securing systems, yes, you have patches, you have uh, critical controls and so on, not. but what are we doing about the conduits? Do we even know which systems are connected and how? The last point is that some people ask me, you know, Shafi, uh, yeah, yeah, I hear you, there's a lot of fear, uncertainty, and uh, I don't know what to do, right? And is there a template I can use? Is there a, a somewhere I can go down there and download a document and I can put it in as policy? And then you, guys, you know what, guys? I, when I was regulator, I had that mindset. I pushed down the policy to the operator. You guys go and deal with it. Find out how to comply with it. And now I'm an operator, I say, come on, right? The real story is that every organization, every company is unique, right? You can't have a quick cutter kind of approach to doing cybersecurity strategy. It needs to be practical in the first place and achievable. No point putting down a, a list of targets or, or solutions to your board of directors and say that I'm going to implement this in the next 12 months, 24 months, and we are done, right? I got asked this question uh, uh, by my board of directors in my company. Uh, uh, Trophy, does it mean that if we give you this budget and implement all these solutions, uh, our OT network is safe? Remember, the word is safe. It's not secure, huh? safe. I said, absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. So with that, uh, I end my talk. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, so my obsession with spaghetti, right? If you are interested, you can actually build something like this with a spaghetti. Thank you. <laughs>Social faith with a very high bar over here, so I hope not to bore you in the next 10 minutes. Um, and my goal for today is to officially launch the rail session of the, of the day. Uh, and today we speak about different modes of transportation, but I think that rail is the most interesting one, and I'll explain very soon why. So what we're going to do in those 10 minutes is gonna, we're going to dive into the different architectures and risks of rail system. It's going to be hard because... Uh, there are a lot of technical aspects that we won't be able to cover, but I hope at least to give you a glimpse of how it looks like and what are the risks. It's time to adjust. So, so again, uh, I'm Mickey Schiffman. I'm CTO and co-founder at Silos. Silos is a company focused on rail cybersecurity. Uh, we are providing security platforms to secure rail operations, transit operations, and freight. Um, we work globally, our solutions are deployed and almost 20 customers worldwide ranging from uh, small light rail systems to the largest freight rail systems in the world. Um, other than being a city and co-founder at Silos, I'm also uh, contributing in different rail cybersecurity working groups. So we have a quite complex challenge in rail. Uh, every system or every country acts a bit differently. 
And what we're trying to do is actually to standardize some of the security measures and controls and the best practices. Uh, and we have a lot of experience in that in silos, so we're trying also to contribute it to the global working groups. And specifically, I'm working uh, with some other people that are in the room here also on uh, a global rail standard called IEC 63452. I don't expect you to remember the number, it's very complicated, but in the end it's supposed to be the golden standard of how to secure railway systems. Okay. Cool, so let's start. If it works. I think it jumps too quick, okay, cool. Am I pointing in? Okay. Sorry. Always like this challenge of uh, trying to adjust to the screens. So let's start by a few quick facts. I told you that uh, we're going to prove that rail is one of the most interesting systems in the world. So let's, let's start by doing that. So first, uh, almost 2 billion people use rail on a daily basis. So in rail, I mean rail, transit, etc. cetera. Um, 50%, and that's an interesting fact, 50% of the metro systems worldwide, they're either in operation or construction, are actually fully automated. And by fully automated, we mean that they support driverless operations. So I know we had uh, the automotive uh, session early on, and uh, we're going to have the aviation session early on, but to me at least, I'm not familiar with any other mode of transport that actually operates in a driverless way and is able to transit so many people on a daily basis. And that's something that happens in rail for a few years now, as you see, like we get to 50% already. And the only reason that it's even possible is technology. Other than that, uh, rail systems uh, or trains, uh, especially in a high speed side, they can get to over 350 kilometers per hour. Why is it so interesting? So when you think about the driver point of view and why is it even driverless in many of the system or moves to be driverless or automated, it's because actually a driver cannot respond as quick uh, or look at signals on the track side. So they cannot really rely on that. And therefore, you need to have automated systems, wireless communications that bring you all the data into the cab. Other than that, the stopping distance of a train can be over one kilometer. Why is that interesting? It's because, again, like you cannot really plan ahead enough. And you cannot visually look and optically just identify the objects. You actually need automated systems to do that. And if you look at a single train, a single train can have hundreds of connected devices communicating with each other. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. So that's how rail systems look today. Uh, and what's interesting here is that the train on the left doesn't have a driver, really. And I, I'm sure some of you took such trains. And the way it operates is that they have a device like on the right. It's a cab signaling system. And that receives in real time the allowed, tra allowed speed that the train is able to move in. Uh, and the way the speed is calculated is actually based by taking into account all the parameters of, those, of the environment, and then you have wireless signals or wireless systems that transmit the information back to the cab. And if we look in the broader scope of rail, um, we actually look in a very big system that consists a lot of subsystems. So as Shofei mentioned, OT is a system of systems. Rail is actually also a system of systems. Uh, and if you look above, we have the operation control centers, the dispatching centers, what you see always with the big screens. Uh, on the center, you have the rolling stock. The rolling stock is not that simple. You have the operational network called TCMS. You have passenger information system, what you see with the driver, uh, what you see as a passenger. Uh, and you also have Wi-Fi, et cetera. And as you can assume, many of them can be connected to each other in different configurations. On the track side, you have train control elements. These are transmitting wireless communication to the train. and uh, give the data on how fast can the train move, and also uh, interlocking systems or signaling systems that are responsible for the alignment of the tracks and effectively the two trains will not collide with each other. On the right, you have the stations themselves. So we saw a lot of cases that stations were hacked and manipulated, and then effectively passengers couldn't buy tickets, they couldn't activate their tickets, so it also led to train stoppage and operations. Uh, problem. And you have a lot of systems here. This diagram, by the way, is taken through from a standard called TS5701. It's a new standard from 2021 that describes the architecture of rail and also how you should secure rail properly. And I want to dive into one of those systems. It's called ERTMS. ERTMS stands for European Rail Traffic Management System. Uh, although it's 
it has European in the name. It's actually a global system. We have people from India and from Israel. We actually operate those systems also in Israel. And the reason the system exists is because in the past you had locomotives with drivers that needed to uh, actually, um, sometimes when train moved between countries, they needed to replace the locomotives because they needed to communicate with dispatching system. Over time, everything was digital communications, and those digital communications use a protocol like ERTMS, and that's a train control uh, protocol. And it actually, the interesting part is it uses, and probably that's the acronym that some people here can identify, uh, GSMR. Uh, so GSMR is based on GSM, and the R is for rail. And GSMR is based on the second, second generation of mobile communication. We know when was the first time it was hacked. It was probably the 90s. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, rail systems use it still up to today. Even in Israel, we deployed those systems probably like three years ago. Um, and those systems are kind of like a mix. They receive information from the track site. You have something on the tracks called balises. They report the location because trains cannot always use GPSs because you have tunnels and things like that. So that's why I use like positioning elements. And all of them should operate together so the train will operate safely and move from one point to another. So that's just the train control system. Let's talk about rolling stock. So we talked about cars. They have lots of systems inside. So trains are quite similar in that sense. But if car is a computer and wheels, train is a data center and wheels because you have so many more devices. You have, tr you have rail cars connected to each other. They're communicating different networks. The networks can change. Everything is quite complex. And, uh, and of course, like most of the networks are relatively flat. Um, you don't have really like serious policy uh, enforcement over there. And if we look here as this example, uh, you see a passenger information system uh, that reports the speed of the train. So I don't know where it's taken from, but actually in similar examples, interesting things that we saw is that this information about the speed was actually taken automatically from the critical system. So it means that you needed to connect those systems that usually connect to the internet to the critical systems without any like security device in, in, in between. And that's, that's a big security challenge. Uh, and actually, you can also see the toilets are occupied over there. So an interesting fact is the toilets have controllers inside them. And when you open and close the door, sometimes the toilet reports whether, the tra whether it's occupied or not. And it does it over the network. Actually, some systems, they say that if the, all the toilets are occupied, the train cannot really, and it's a high-speed train where there is an error in the toilets, they can't really like, move the train in high-speed train. And an interesting fact that we saw some train architectures in which the toilets included connection to the main controller networks. And you can't actually physically secure them because you can't put cameras in the toilet and make sure that no one interrupts with them. So that's, that's a challenge. Uh, unfortunately, it is what it is. So they evolve over time, and hopefully it's not going to happen in the future. So just to summarize a little bit about rail, like another effect of rail is that there are 30 years of life cycle in most rail systems. It means that you deploy a train now, it's going to operate for 30 years. You can think what the security implications are, even if you take 30 years backwards and think what we knew about security back then. Other than that, we have like super rigid safety constraints. Sometimes like the easy challenge is how to secure a train, the hard challenge, and some people here can say is how you can actually put the, uh, put the security devices and implement them with the safety constraints. You have proprietary technologies, so most of the rail suppliers or most of the critical systems in rail used only in rail, so the security practices are not really known worldwide for that. Uh, and you have shared ownership. So I, saw bef I showed before this system that communicates between a train to the ground. Actually, the interesting part, and we have here, Dimitri, you can say that, that actually could be two different companies that own those systems, and they have shared responsibility over the overall system. So you have the train operator company, it's one company, and the infrastructure manager, it's another company. And that's also a mess when you try to consider how you secure it all together and how you ensure security. But the good news is that we're still like, going on the right track. So uh, recently, like in 2021, there was this TS5701 standard that was published. It's supposed to take us forward to a better security practice. We're now working on the next generation of it with IEC. Uh, in the U.S., you have security directives that were published by the TSA, and they're now getting implemented by the different uh, rail and transit operators. In Europe, you have the NIST-2 directives that are enhancement of the NIST directives, and they're also uh, uh, kind of like ensure security in rail operations. So I believe we're on the right track, and we have interesting challenges moving forward, but hopefully the industry is lined together to achieve them. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Miki. Please stay. Yeah. I'm going to moderate the next panel. So, uh, let me introduce our distinguished panelists. 
Mr. Eddie Tetsi, VP Cybersecurity from Aston. <laughs> Dimitri Van Zevtliet, Zev Director of Cybersecurity NS. And Asaf Gal, Director Head of Cybersecurity and SCADA System at NTA. And Mark Conard, <laughs> Assistant VP and Deputy CISO for Amtrak. No. Cool. Cool. It work. Right, so uh, the next part of our rail session is going to be actually giving the real experts to talk here. Uh, good with the technical parts? Not yet, yeah. Should solve it Cyber Week, probably something got hacked there in, this, in the microphone. Uh, cool. So I'm really proud to introduce this panel. So initially when I saw the speakers list, I said like, yeah, wow, well, that's the, probably one of the best panels that I saw in the rail security space. Now I also see it's probably the best, best dressed panel of the day. Um, so what we have here is uh, we have representatives from four different countries uh, that are well-esteemed security leaders uh, in the rail cyber security space. They represent both the operating side as well as the supplier side uh, and also operate in companies that actually control different scope, I think, of rail operations. So we have something between mainline to rolling stock to light rail here. Um, and I really like excited to kind of like give the uh, give, give our panelists today I'm really excited to give the panelists today an opportunity to introduce us to their day-to-day -day lives uh, working in rail cybersecurity uh, and I think that what we're going to do is kick off with uh, a round of introductions so uh, I would like each of our panelists to introduce it himself uh, and also maybe ex share some of his day-to-day -day responsibilities and of course roles. Uh, so let's start with it. So Dimitri, you are first in line. Okay, so let's start with Mark. Uh, okay. I don't. Hey. Your, your works, I guess. Hello? You guys can hear me? Yeah, we can. I think we can hear. So, uh, Mark Conrad, I am the uh, deputy CISO at uh, Amtrak. Uh, I also have a cyber defense uh, that includes um, care of the OT assessments, IT cyber assessments, and multiple infrastructure. Um, in addition to that, we have the Security Operations Center, which we are transforming into all the Cyber Fusion Center, uh, which the pillar of that is really driving in cyber threat intelligence uh, as a core component, driving assessments, uh, driving all of our operations down the road. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Asaf, should we move to you? Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Asaf Gal, head of cybersecurity and SCADA systems in NETA, Metropolitan Mass Transit System in Israel. I'm almost 20 years in the cybersecurity industry, in particular uh, dealing with operational technologies and SCADA. And in my current role in NETA for the last four years, I have three major responsibilities. The first one, of course, is cybersecurity. Uh, dealing with all of NETA's projects, uh, you probably know of uh, the red, green, and purple lines of the light rail trains. Also, three heavy metro lines which will come in the future. Uh, the second role is SCADA system, our SCADA that deals with all of the traction and utilities of the trains and facilities of all of the electromechanical equipment, basically everything that is not power. My third and final role is system engineering, dealing with complex interfaces and transverse systems, challenges and issues. Thank you very much, Asaf. 
Hello, my name is Eddie Tese. I'm in charge of cyber security for Alstom. So Alstom is a mobility maker in railway. Uh, I started this composition a couple of years ago. We build system of system quite complex and cyber security on top of that uh, bring complexity. Maybe in the course of the discussion, I will explain to you why we need to put sensors on the toilets. <laughs> Cool. Thank you, Eddie. Dimitri is the person without the mic. Hot, hot. Oh, you're you're going to pass the strongest message, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Sit. Yeah, it's working. <laughs> hot, hot. <laughs> Good evening. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's, that's you. Hello, yeah. So my name is Dimitri van Zandvliet. In uh, the Netherlands, uh, I'm uh, CISO of uh, Dutch Railways. And um, next to that, I'm also uh, the co-chair of uh, the ISAC, the Real ISAC, the Dutch ISAC, the European ISAC. And we recently founded a, a CISO forum with all the European railway uh, CISOs. Um, and talking about toilets, and so, there's a, in the chemical toilets, they have this function that you can flush it when it's clocked. And there's also a function that you can have a reversed flushing. So our red team, they have a ball when they test that function. So you say that reverse flushing is also a command you can send and it's a potential threat vector. Okay, got it. Uh, a lot of people are going to be surprised here. Uh, cool. So... Um, so, okay, so our goal is kind of like let each panelist share of their perspectives and they played also different parts in the life cycle of purchasing and operations of uh, train and rail systems in general. Uh, and I would like to maybe start with Mark. Uh, and Mark, as the deputy CISO of Amtrak, I assume, and also like, especially with the increasing geopolitical situations and the new regulations, I assume that something has changed in the threat landscape recently. So can you maybe share with the audience like what are like what is Amtrak looking at when they're exploring the threats on their rail and critical rail technology environments or so <laughs> I guess we're on um, for, for Amtrak uh, that that is actually the US's largest passenger rail um, from a uh, railroad perspective. Um, threats that we've been looking at um, across the board have been really about taking um, legacy uh, Amtrak and that convergence and transformation uh, of digital recently received a large number uh, or a large fund from the government uh, to provide that transformation that's tracks that's tunnels uh, but that also includes uh, our rolling stock as well which but was well uh, and all those connectivity points that have to be from our standpoint, we have uh, new regulations as well, um, and that actually started from um, some cyber uh, issues with our water supply uh, and some hacks that, that started there, uh, which translated into very similar uh, devices that we use rail, uh, so that it, it, it showed the opportunity that you can actually you can poison a water supply. Um, and so those regulations started there. They worked with that um, sector. Um, and then they started looking at the other sectors, to vulnerabilities in those areas. And so from a rail perspective, uh, those regulations are here. Um, I believe these, these <coughs> regulations by TSA are, are actually the fundamental aspects. They're the that basic hygiene that every, um, every rail organization really needs to understand that cyber is a way of doing business. Um, it has to be a component of your business, um, and it is a business value um, that you have to really think through, um, because that is, can be a fact whether or not things trains automobiles. So from those aspects, um, we are putting together uh, an overall strategy with regard to how do we protect the IT, OT, um, and IoT. Amtrak perspective, and everyone's different up, up here with regard to scope of does um, we're half of you because I had a ton of meetings this week uh, so you already heard this but, but Amtrak is more than just a passenger train 
Uh, we have our own electric grid that we have to affect. have one of the largest police forces in the U.S., or not, uh, with a large canine program, uh, that perspective. Uh, we have this infrastructure bill that's going to be providing a large transformation for us. Um, and then the convergence of all of that coming. So it really is a, a amazing time at Amtrak for, for us to be able to kind of get ahead of the curve. Um, unfortunately, uh, they're in a great position here for uh, security by design. Uh, we are security from behind. Um, and so we really have to prioritize all of those uh, risks that we have uh, aligned to the investments, aligned to the risk. Pull all those together to really kind of put the program private forward. Thank you very much, Mike. So uh, my next question is going to be to Asaf. So Asaf, as the Chief Information Security Officer of NTA, so NTA is a new company, essentially, like it's probably the only real company here in the forum, which I'm not sure how much is it, like 10 years old, five, five to 10 years old, probably. And you are now responsible for like a large mega transport project in Israel, but you all have a unique opportunity. You can start from scratch and actually design security as Mark said, right, right from the get-go. So can you maybe share with the audience how you actually do that and how, how an ideal world looks like? Sure. So in order to answer that question, first we need to understand the complexity that is involved with mega rail projects. Um, to understand this complexity, let's take the red line for example. Uh, if you go to the contractors, there are three major groups of contractors. One is civil, the other is fit out, and the third is rail systems, what we like to call infrastructure too. And those contractors probably have different approach to cybersecurity and also assumably different contractors, uh, do different contracts, sorry. And I want to take a, a deep dive into the system groups and to add another group to the table, in addition to the one that uh, Wang and Mickey uh, explained earlier about the rail system, which is the fit-out system. Imagine a huge mall, a market mall, with three floors. Now put it 30 meters underground. In order to operate this big mall, multiple by 10, because we have 10 underground stations in the red line, we have to have a um, building management system, controls lighting, HVAC, escalators, elevators, drainage, many other systems. And those systems must be secured as well because without HVAC, air condition, you don't have computers. And without computers, you don't have trains. And on top of that, there are the rail systems, which are more than 40 rail systems, like signaling, which in the red line uh, is communication-based, and uh, it brings the uh, rolling stock, the train, to drive autonomously uh, 12 kilometers uh, below the ground. And in addition to it, you have fire safety system, tunnel ventilation system. So it's, when it comes to operation and safety, we must secure those systems. And if we take the uh, fact that we have different contracts, different systems, it's a big challenge. To overcome this complexity, we must have two things combined. One is dedicated specification, and the other one is enforcement mechanism. The dedicated specification brings us three benefits. The first one is a commitment of the contractors to bring you an adequate cybersecurity system to the table. Um, and uh, the second one is uh, what, like uh, Mark uh, explained, it's cyber by design. We treat the cyber security the same as any other system. It means it's aligned through the V model with all the commercial milestones of the project, same as data center, same as station uh, network, same as signaling. Cyber is just the same commercially and operationally. The third one, Neta is defined INCD is a critical state infrastructure. So we must put this highly strict regulation into uh, this specification. But as I said earlier, specification is not enough. Just a teaser, a good teaser, 
or a, a movie. But without the enforcement mechanism, you don't have a plot, and you don't have a movie. So you must uh, have a very good enforcement mechanism throughout all the projects. It starts with, with what we like to call a CMP, Urban Management Plan. The contractor, by specification, is obliged to bring you a cyber management plan at the start of the project. There he needs to explain how we can enforce, not just how we can do something, how we can enforce it and prove it throughout all the project. If it's in the design, how to uh, cyber secure all of the systems, not just the main parts with firewall and so on, but every system, the video surveillance system, okay, show me the architecture. If your subcontractors doesn't comply, okay, so how are you going to enforce it? What is the commercial tools? What are your plan to do it? After that, installations. I have 24 kilometers. How can I know who is going to the central rooms? Someone from civil is going inside the signaling rooms. How will you install it? How will you do the whitening, sanitarization, the hardening of each part? It to enforce a mechanism for the commissioning, even before we went to uh, operation and to uh, operator and his position. Later on, there is the testing and commissioning phase, where he needs to verify that everything was done according to his commitment and design. Is every system is standalone, later on is integrated. Also, dynamic tests when the train drives and we check cyber secured all the system. So to summarize, Mickey, in order to enforce effective cybersecurity, mega complex rail systems, <coughs> you must have a dedicated specification, also effective enforcement mechanism. Perfect. Thank you very much, Asaf. So, Eddie, now after uh, we had a rail operator explaining their requirements and what they expect from you as a uh, as a large rail manufacturer, probably one of the largest in the world. Uh, can you maybe tell us uh, your journey uh, inside Alstom in terms of like how the Alstom security organization has evolved over time, where it started from, what is it, what is it doing today, just for the audience to get an understanding how rail manufacturers treat that? So, we, we, we started first by explaining to people what we cannot do, because it's funny because we, we started cyber security in a railway a little bit late compared to any other industry started in a ground where safety was the heart of anything. Railway is the safest way, way of transportation that you have in the world. And there is a reason for that. It's full of control, processes, verification. There is a word people like proven in use. <coughs> Most of the operators, they like proven in use system. What does this mean? Them which has been demonstrated during a couple of years. In India is two years, in Singapore it's be more. In France it's five years. So this means that innovation, new technologies, is complex to bring. So as, a, as a manufacturer, when you build those complex systems of systems, because you are challenged both on the water in the toilet, but also on breaking 400 or 500,000 tons, 400 or 500 tons uh, trains in less than two kilometers. So you are challenged on very, very different Where to address those challenges, we had to put more and more technologies. And Mickey was saying that we have a different grade of automations, from one to four, and that's true that most of the trains which are operated today in the world are able to operate in a certain level of autonomy, from zero driver, zero operator, one at, also at staff attending in the train in case of, uh, to uh, one person driving the train. We have those grade of automation. So as, an, as a manufacturer, and I, I speak for Alstom, but I think that most of us had the same journey, you first need to start to look at the future. And then came a lot of words like uh, trust, security by design, and so on. So we embrace them. The reality is that part of the bricks that we are using are old bricks, like the protocols, the safety protocols, some of the components, and they will remain there. They will remain there. So nevertheless, we did this first part of the journey, which is, for the future, we will define rules, we will define principles that will be applied for new systems. And thanks to the standards, so we can talk about the 5701, there is the 53452 which is coming, so we invest a lot of effort in that in order to have regulation in our industry. 
second important topic was the install base. We are seated, 1 uh, billion of people, uh, more or less 2 billion now, yeah. taking trains every day. So there is trains running. They are today running with technology. So it was very important to start to secure <coughs> those. And unfortunately, if you want to secure a safety regulated system already in production, driving uh, 500 to 600 people on board, you cannot come and make a patch every day. It makes no sense. It's impossible to address. So we had to invent a new way to do security. And that's through the dialogue with the CISO and the authorities. Sometimes it's a little complex because the expectation in terms of uh, reaction, patching, protection is at a certain level. Technical feasibility is something else. So then we had to address the second leg, which is uh, what do we do for our existing install base? How can we make sure that they will continue to operate the system safely? And the third leg of the journey was related to the operation of all those systems. It's good to put security controls, and we are putting some of them, but who will operate them? You cannot have a security team totally disconnected from the operation team. Railway operators are very used to manage uncertainty, to manage incidents, not to manage cyber security. So they need to grow up a little bit and to make sure that they have this fusion center <laughs> where you put in the same room, the guy who knows safety, the guy who knows operation, and the guy who knows cyber security. And that is the third leg of the journey. And, and really, I think that in the industry today, in railway, we are in this moment of uh, growing on those topics. If I, if I can say something which is missing, missing, I would say to move forward more quicker, maybe more collaborations. Mm. We are not that used to collaborate too. Okay, so that it will be good to have more collaboration and to manage our, our suppliers, I would say, uh, ecosystem a little bit better. Today, Myself and my competitors, we are managing our suppliers in silos. Whereas, if you look at really, we have the same suppliers. So, this is things where we can improve today. More dialogue with the, with the operators to, to things along. Because if you look at any system that you have to deliver, it is between three years and uh, ten years to design and deliver a, rail, a railway system. We cannot change the, the rules in one year or two. This collaboration things is, a, is a, one of the important things. That we have. Perfect. Thank you very much. Good. Cool. Uh, so now that we heard like from different perspectives and point of views uh, of like what are the challenges, how suppliers treat them and how operators treat them, maybe Dimitri you can help us to understand how the rail cybersecurity world moving forward is going to look like and what should be a strategy when we look forward. Yeah, well, first of all, I think the strategy today won't be the same as the strategy next year. Um, and, and, and to summarize a little bit, uh, uh, we've, we've looked at the attack surface and that's uh, growing rapidly because of the digitization of, uh, of our uh, rolling stock, of our uh, infrastructure. Uh, so, uh, for example, in the Netherlands we have uh, this uh, mobile app and then you can use it for door-to-door -door mobility. So it's not only trains, it's also cars and, and bicycles, electric bicycles, scooters. Um, so it means we are a, a hyper-connected uh, organization. Uh, not only chemical toilets with IP addresses, but also, you know, mobile apps. Uh, we have uh, over uh, 12 billion uh, uh, I API calls uh, every year. So that's, uh, that's increasing uh, every year. And the other thing is that, uh, for example, um, the threat landscape has, um, has changed radically. I mean, uh, for the last year, a lot of uh, OT malware has been uh, designed not only to uh, cause mayhem, but also to uh, wipe away, for example. Uh, so we had to have new, um, uh, we had to build new scenarios uh, for spillover effects and to, to make sure the trains were uh, still running. And we did it in collaboration uh, with, uh, with the suppliers. So I fully agree with Eddie. More collaboration is, uh, is needed on that part. Also, the third thing why we do all this is uh, the legislation. You talked about it a little bit. It's not only the NIST 2, uh, it's the CER uh, in Europe, uh, it's the, the RED. Uh, there's six new cyber laws that are coming our way and we, we better be prepared because it's a lot of work uh, to do. And as uh, some of the, the, the colleagues already said, uh, we weren't the first sector that were embracing cybersecurity. Banks were way ahead of us. So we have some catching up to do and in the same time, uh, you know, uh, deal with all the threats. Now, I can only speak for our organization. Uh, there's four fundamental bricks that we use for uh, the strategy, and uh, the first one has been mentioned before. It's shifting left, radically shifting left. So 
uh, catching up with uh, old times, but also preventing the crane from leaking. So whenever we design new uh, train series, uh, we work together with uh, Alstom, for example, and the latest train, they, they, they have more than 100 uh, CPUs, they have 400. Yeah. So it's, a, it's, it's not only a driving uh, a data center, it's, a, it's an edge computer. So more and more uh, uh, compute power will be uh, done on the train. Um, so for the, the, the coming years, uh, we will design uh, trains that have uh, anomaly detection on board uh, that will connect to the, uh, the track site. Uh, and, and in the SOC, we will have a holistic overview of all the, the events that are going on, not only incidents, but every, uh, every event. Uh, we will have a better view and understanding of all the assets uh, in, the, uh, in the landscape which is clearly lacking at the moment. Sometimes, uh, I mean, we, we have shadow IT, uh, we have shadow data, we have shadow cloud. Um, we need to be more, uh, you know, uh, involved in the, who owns the assets. Uh, so shifting left is, uh, is for us um, uh, pivotal, and uh, we are going to uh, enable that by uh, bringing standardized and centralized services, cybersecurity services, to our, for example, 350 DevOps teams. Um, so they are not allowed any longer to have uh, their uh, exotic uh, pipeline tools. Uh, we want to have more standardized uh, solutions and, uh, you know, to, to, to bring everything to a more convergence-focused uh, uh, approach. And if we, if we make sure as a cyber organization that they can uh, rapidly use our services, uh, then we can, you know, uh, take away some of the burden for them. The third part has been mentioned before is uh, zero trust. So not only for the IT, IoT, but also for the OT part, the same principle go. Um, you know, having, um, being able to have uh, real-time policy enforcement towards your assets, uh, towards uh, the data, to, to uh, micromanage uh, and micro-segment all your uh, networks uh, to be able to isolate uh, an endpoint. I think that's a, that's a big challenge, and we are working with that, uh, with uh, you know, the, on the network side, on the identity part, on the um, uh, uh, well, what have you? Uh, it's it's a lot of work. Um, and the fourth, uh, I think, pillar is uh, all about uh, the culture, cyber safe culture. So uh, we've been driving trains for 184 years now, and we are just the tenth. Um, safety area. So we have uh, railway safety, there's uh, food safety, there is uh, S10. And the rest are already in the DNA. You can't uh, uh, get up on the top of a train without holding the, the railing of the, of the stairs. You'll, someone will tell you and uh, you, you have to wear your hat and you steal uh, uh, shoes. So uh, the same will have to do that for, uh, for uh, the cyber uh, controls. And that's a, that's a mind mindset. Uh, it, it's going to take a couple of years, I think. We don't have 184 years. Uh, it has to be done uh, faster. And in, in this area, we need to collaborate. We just started a new cyber academy uh, for because you know the, the resources are uh, hard to find in the uh, in the whole world. So we need to collaborate uh, not only with the peers from uh, from the railway uh, operators and infrastructure managers, but also with the suppliers. So. Uh, there's a lot of work to do. Definitely, definitely. Thank you very much, Dimitri. So as we are approaching the end of the panel, maybe I would let uh, each of the speakers give... Uh, no, uh, let's take one question from the audience then, maybe, and... Uh, yeah, please. By the fact that too many people are using frequently the term ITOT convergence, Cyber security inside of the risk Cool. Uh, I will say, uh, as a OEM in the real industry, we don't use this ITOT conversion. I will say, uh, from a union point of view, what we do is very complex system. So, this ITOT conversion for me is a concept that we don't really use. I mean, we secure our system, and within our system, we have industrial parts which are very. Uh, computer which were made a couple of years ago and so on. And we have very brand new technologies which are very close to what you find in your enterprise network. We make a difference between the enterprise network, because the operator will pay his employee, will manage his uh, uh, HR and so on, and the operational system where they will operate their trains. There is a lot of things to do that. There is very old computers and brand new data application in the cloud. But all of that for us remain an industrial control system. We put people on board of the train and their life can be at stake. 
This will make, make a barrier. Manage travel of people. After this ITOT, consider it's more kind of a word that we don't use. Perfect. Thank you very much. So maybe let give, uh, let's give the panelists who wants to give a short uh, closing statement just for the audience, something you want them to remember. So Mark, let's start from you. Uh, so, so Dimitri actually touched on it, and, and there are a number of pillars that we I can really a lot of it probably this is really it was around the people. Um, and it's bringing together the operators, it's bringing cyber, it's bringing IT. A lot of organizations, IT and cyber don't really get along, uh, but you have to make those investments. By not doing that, you're going to risk uh, not having a successful project. People, the process, making sure that you have that um, policies in place, people process, our, uh, biggest piece. Rail is safety first. At the end of the day, uh, after security, that safety. So if you can kind of frame your strategy around those areas, um, you have a good good idea of being a, a success, success path down the road. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. Saf? So, as uh, I explained earlier, uh, the, cl the complexity of mega rail projects requires uh, dedicated specification and enforcement mechanism to overcome this complexity and achieve effective cybersecurity. Effective cybersecurity will allow us to have uh, to prevent operational disruptions and uh, damage to assets, and more, most important, uh, the safety of the passenger and uh, the staff. Perfect. Thank you, Saf. Eddie? From, from the operation, operator's point of view, oh, I'm not operator yet. Uh, <laughs> you changed jobs during the final. From the manufacturer's manufacturer point of view, you know, what is important is we deliver railway system, and we take always the problem from this end. So we do cyber security mm -hmm. in our railway system. Railway went through several revolutions over the last 50, 50 years, I would say. City to computer to connectivity, and cyber is a new one. At the end of the day, you will board the train to go from A to B. That's really what is driving our, our, our journey. Perfect. Dimitri? Well, nobody said AI. Uh, you, can't <laughs> you can't have a panel. Bring us some AI here. <laughs> I, I would like to, say, to end with uh, experimental governance. So uh, we see new technologies, new trends, new uh, threats uh, coming at us. And uh, we can't have uh, 184 years to develop new policies and new uh, uh, ways, ways of working. So we started with uh, experimental government, uh, governance and, and we tell the business we know it's not finished, we know it's not uh, adequate yet, but uh, please use it and look, look back to us. Uh, so we, we try to be more agile uh, with uh, our policies as well. Perfect. Thank you very much. So I heard a lot of things here, the connections between IT to operations, uh, the enforcement, the specifications, of course, keeping in mind that our goal is also to uh, pass, uh, to have passengers and goods moving from one point to the other and of course maintaining agility in the organization. I think these are uh, great messages and great points to remember from here. So I would like to thank our panelists and give them a big round of applause. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. What a great talk. So we want to continue. Yes, yes. Yeah. But there's no sit down, there's no racist now. All right. Please sit down, there's no racist now. <laughs> we are moving to our next speaker. Please take your seats. All right. I would like to invite to this stage Mr. Cordell Shaster, CIO at U.S. Department of Transportation, to talk about U.S. transportation sector cybersecurity. Cordell serves as a principal advisor 
to the Secretary of Transportation and to the leadership of DOT Operating Administration on matters involving information technology and information assurance, including cybersecurity and privacy. Kodel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It takes me a minute or so to get set up. Uh, so, hello from the United States. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. And I, I think it's terrific that there's an entire day dedicated to transportation. And I think what we'll find over the next few years that transportation is going to eat the conference. Because there's just so many things that as, as good and smart as, as the other speakers are, um, we're just scratching the surface. And, and there's many more connections to make and uh, subjects to go into more deeply. So what I want to do is take a baseline photo and then compare it to next year but I'll bet you we have two or three times the people participating. All right? So everybody get ready to smile. <laughs> of course, I want to be in it. All right. One, two, three. Transportation. <laughs> All right. So I want to thank Gilly and team uh, for uh, hosting me here and, and staging a terrific conference. I want to thank uh, Tamir um, Garan and the INCD uh, for uh, setting up some sessions for me outside the conference. Um, it's been really both eye-opening but also confirming that those of us in the transportation space are all dealing with the same problems. We all have the same challenges, whether they're cyber or operational or staffing or especially coordination and integration. Um, hopefully, we're going to solve some of those problems together. And through conferences like this and best practice sharing, um, it accelerates that problem solving. So I'm the United States Department of Transportation CIO. And mostly that means I have the privilege of being responsible for everybody's IT problems. And IT problems more and more are cyber problems, even if the folks don't realize it. And if they, they don't even realize that some of their current practices are tempting even more problems occurring. And when we involve ourselves in, in their business, in their operations as IT or cyber experts, not necessarily experts in the nine different modes of transportation that DOT either operates or oversees, they try to push us out of the room. But, but the truth is, and I'm going to go back to the question from a couple of minutes ago, IT used to be IT, and OT was OT. But increasingly, OT is IT. And, and you could have expertise in that area, in that OT area, but if you don't understand the IT controls that are needed, you're going to fail at the OT mission. And then you have the hybrid where, even though you don't want it, the IT system has to touch the OT system. So that integration and the cooperation that's needed to make the system secure, both from an IT and an operational perspective, is a new challenge for all of us. And let's face it, nobody wants other people in their business, right? Everyone's very proud. Um, uh, transportation has a, a terrific legacy of, of engineering discipline. And, and frankly, being funded better than some of the other departments or agencies because if there's a pothole, a hole in the street, the public expects it to be filled. If trains are running late because there's not enough of them, the public expects the authority to buy more trains, to manage traffic better. So transportation has the, the luxury of being better funded and I think has this, this legacy of very rational engineering discipline, but on the other hand, a lot of it is, is expected of us. I'm going to tell just a short story. Hopefully, there will be some time at the end for questions and answers. And the short story is about how the US Department of Transportation, through the law that Mark Conrad mentioned earlier, is making our transportation infrastructure secure by design uh, for the next generation and the next generation. 
And we're doing that through a $1 trillion U.S. investment called the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. It's also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. And then when you start abbreviating that, because everybody wants to create acronyms, it gets very vague. So either EJA or Bill or IRA, and you're talking about people's names, and they have no idea what you're talking about. But the goals of the project are very important. So one, we see transportation nationwide as a way to help grow the economy, that you can't um, improve a business without having ways of getting people and goods around more efficiently and safely. Two, we want to increase in the U.S. U.S. competitiveness. We, it, it is a global marketplace for transportation now, and we want to participate in that market. We want to create good jobs. So we experience what we call the hollowing out of the middle class as IT is replacing a lot of jobs. Robotics are taking the place of factory line workers. We believe that reinvesting in transportation can replace some of those jobs, and some of those jobs will last and be operational. And what we're hoping is this investment, although it happens once in a generation, is going to take a long time to spend. So this is not going to be a quick little um, jolt for the economy, but it will be something that continues on. And probably most importantly, we want our transportation systems to be safe, to be resilient, and equitable. That too many communities in the U.S. have been left out of transportation. They haven't had access to systems and stations. They've been unable to reach good jobs and good schools because the transportation sector not only didn't think of them, but in some cases highways and railroads were built specifically to divide communities. So we're trying to go back to the future and correct those mistakes and make things fair going forward. So the, the, the key for me in this law is, I think what should be its name, but it kind of gets lost in all the conversation, which is to build back better with this trillion dollar investment, which is a lot of money even in the U.S. and among all the things that we have to pay for, we can do better than we did before. And one, ways that we, one way that we want to do better is to meet the needs of both physical and cyber hazards. So included in every tender or what we call notice of funding opportunities, which announces that a grant is available. And we're making grant money available in every transportation area from aviation to maritime to rail to roads, um, trucking. Um, there's programs that both allocate money by previous formulas as well as allocate money in a competition about who has the best idea to meet the goals of, of this program. And in each of these tenders is language that says, we want infrastructure to be secure against both physical and cyber threats. So from a cybersecurity perspective, which is our interest in this, and originally, our organization of, of the CIO at the U.S. Department of Transportation was mostly concerned with enterprise cyber. But the White House recognized that with this large program, this was an opportunity to start building infrastructure secure by design. So we had the cybersecurity experts in the office of the CIO. So we either leaned in or agreed to lead both the structuring of all the paperwork, like that tender language, as well as how do we operationalize secure by design and have the same basic risk management framework apply whether you're repaving a road, rebuilding a bridge, creating a new signaling system, investing in Amtrak, they're getting a lot of our money. You're welcome, Mark. <laughs> um, 
because all of the operational technology is different. So what we decided is to create a gate in the beginning. And that's to look at the project and decide a broad assessment of its risk. And first is if it has little or no IT, if you're just paving a road, just putting up guardrail, maybe important for your community, it does not present a cybersecurity risk. So then we would say you have low risk and we let it go without any further action. But either if you're creating an IT system or the IT system is important to your project, then we're going to assess that as elevated risk and try to apply four basic principles that we call our cybersecurity approach. So first, we want each organization to designate a cybersecurity point of contact. For those of us in the field, that's like common sense, right? But the problem with common sense, and I hope this joke translates, the problem with common sense is it's not too common. So you, you could have even relatively complex organizations very good at what they do, but do not have a cybersecurity practice. And cybersecurity is just something that's either in the CIO's office without having particular expertise, or very often in the office of the head of administration or the head of budget. So whether that person yet is cyber trained, and we have lots of very small towns with one or two buses, small community air, um, airfields, with the same guy on the radio who mows the grass. Unfortunately, they're going to have to be our cybersecurity point of contacts. And the reason why that's mm -hmm. important is number two. If you have a cyber incident, if you suspect a cyber incident, you need to know in advance who you need to call. So that cybersecurity point of contact at least has to be trained to make that call. And in the US, we have two places where we want them to call. And they can take their choice. They can call the FBI, or they can call CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency that's under the Department of Homeland Security. <clears throat> Both of them exchange information. Um, when I talk to industry groups and other government organizations, each one has a favorite. And that's fine, as long as they call one right away. And there's a reluctance to call because you're admitting a weakness, you're admitting a mistake. But after the excellent presentation we saw from CrowdStrike this morning, there's no reason to be ashamed. Like, you know, we're seeing orders of magnitude more attack attempts every year. And it is very difficult to keep up with them. And some of them, yeah, you hit yourself in the head and you said, we had noticed that this was exploited in the wild. We should have prioritized it, and we didn't, so shame on us. But there are so many that it's hard to keep up with. And there's both a, a, a tug of war, if you will, within the U.S. government and around U.S. companies about do you promote this information widely so everybody knows, and maybe when you have a friend who's been attacked, it may motivate you um, to take action, or when you tell CISA, should it be like you're telling your doctor about your problem? And you don't want them sharing that information. And right now, there's a more conservative approach, like telling your doctor, which is based on a history when there weren't so many. Uh, but I, I, I believe this is an area where when we all share information, we'll all do better. And, and we were attacked about... Um, two and a half months ago now, and for the first time, uh, one of our, and, and we did it, an agency reported this in a general discussion at a CIO council in the federal government that meets quarterly. And people were surprised that we were up front with it, but the issue is there's no shame. And it turned out there were three other departments who also were hacked by the very same um, threat vector. Whether it was the same threat actor, we don't know yet. But the idea is 
by sharing information, sharing um, response activities. Um, perhaps someone did something that we didn't think of or we thought of something that they didn't that will all get better and improve our practice for the federal government. So those first two portions of our cybersecurity approach, remember I was talking about our cybersecurity approach before I got off on these other tangents, those are the two easy ones, right? You could do that in one day. Name a person, give them a phone number. The next two get a little harder. And the third one is to create a cybersecurity incident response plan. And what that means is knowing not only after you make that phone call, but what are you going to do afterwards? What's the criticality of the systems that could be at risk? Are they systems that are so critical that have to continue operating? Or are there systems that if they're compromised, you can take them down because you're worried about um, um, other effects of continuing to operate in an integrated state? And then the fourth and the hardest, and not hardest because it's difficult, but hardest because it's going to take a while to do, is to create a cybersecurity self-assessment. And that's to analyze your organization and, and determine where your strengths and weaknesses are. And we're giving um, uh, grantees two years to complete that. We expect in the first year they're basically mobilizing, getting organized, they're hiring their business partners, and we'd expect, especially with a, an organization that's not cyber mature, for them to engage a partner to help do that assessment. And a shout out to the rail folks, our Federal um, Transit Administration was the first one who moved out on this and created a form they call the CAT form, Cybersecurity Assessment for Threats. It's, it's available for the public at DOT's website, transportation.gov, and I believe it's going to be the beginning of, of a whole practice of cybersecurity threat assessment for all transportation sectors. So um, kudos to the rail folks and transit folks. So um, I didn't keep it as short as I wanted, sorry. <laughs> but um, I would be willing to take some questions um, for as long as they'll let me. I really think, and um, I'll go back to the healthcare and doctor example, you've got to tell the truth. Like your doctor can't help you if you're not telling them that you're drinking a six pack a day. And you may have other symptoms that you don't think are related to the, to the drinking, but it's certainly going to be a factor. And um, just a, a quick story, uh, my current boss, who's the deputy secretary of the Department of Transportation, was the commissioner of New York City's Department of Transportation when I had a similar role there. And she came from the US Department of Transportation, and I had been in the city for years. So she came in, she didn't know that much about IT at the time, and she said, you know, what really bothered me about IT, and, and really the thing that I, I, I know, is how healthcare.gov failed. And do you know what happened, and is it gonna happen here? And I said, as I understand the story, and I'm in New York City, I wasn't in Washington at the time. But the people involved with launching healthcare.gov knew it could not sustain the traffic. And it eventually crashed. And no one who was close to the president, President Obama, had the courage to tell him. Because the decision to go was literally at that level. And I promised her, I will tell you. And I will tell you the truth. So I think these CISOs that you mentioned got themselves in trouble because they think that their, um, their value and the value of their company could be affected by um, ad admitting a problem, but only by being transparent, only by understanding that we all need to collaborate together as not only a transportation sector, but as a transportation industry, are we going to get on the other side of these problems? Great question.
That's it. Thank you very much, everyone. Glad to be here. All right, thank you very much, Cordell. And now we are going to talk about aviation cybersecurity. Our next speaker is Avi Tenenbaum, CEO, Cyvation. Avi is a passionate business and techno technology entrepreneur who holds a BA in economics and East Asian studies from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and an MBA in marketing and global business from Tel Aviv University. Today, Avi will talk about implementing cybersecurity measure in the aviation industry. Avi, you are good to take off. So how am I between now and lunch? Challenging. <laughs> Cordell, I want to say thank you. Where are you? Where is Cordell? Ah, I want to say thank you because some of the points you mentioned are exactly the same order I put in my slides. So I guess it's a, it's a good thing. Uh, before we start, I think over the morning, over all the sessions over here, I get uh, one outcome. Guys, there is a lot of work to do. So many challenges, all of us in every aspect of communication, or, sorry, transportation. We just have a lot of fights to make, a lot of uh, challenges to overcome. And, you know, we're going to have a business now for the next couple of years. No worries. Um, Aviation. I'm talking specifically on aircraft. This is our focus. This aviation was uh, designed, built, formed to address uh, public, uh, private, private jets and uh, commercial aviation. We are partly owned by IAI, Israeli Aerospace Industries, members of which uh, have been presenting here today. So what is it about aviation? And Chris is with me over here, and we were together in the same spot here last year, what changed over the last year? There are more attacks. Is any airline admitted that uh, air, aircraft has been tempered? The answer is no. They call it technical glitch. So if uh, somebody wants to know what's cyber, they can just move and say, look for technical glitch. Probably half of them are cyber. Um, most of those rounds, you can find it uh, online very nice. You click cert and you find it. Most of it is uh, airports, uh, airlines, very few, if any, mention an aircraft. And there is a reason, because the first time an aircraft, an airline, will admit that their aircraft has been subject to a cyber attack, I want to see one of the guys over here, or the ladies, actually board this flight. It will take time. It's about reputation. When we look at cyber attack, and just to get us up to speed, let's look at a couple of samples. Singapore Airline, one of my favorite uh, airlines, Sometime, when was it? Uh, June last year. Flight from Los Angeles to back to Singapore. Beautiful Airbus 360. Flight crew is excellent. Everybody is good. Reaching cruising altitude and reporting back to the ground. Hey, we've been hijacked. Hijacked, not na nothing below that. They set up two uh, fighter jets to escort the plane, talking to the pilot. He thinks it's a, some sort of an exercise. Eventually, they figure out somebody, somehow, reach the, um, um, a certain box that report uh, code 7500, which is, we've been hijacked. Nobody touched the aircraft. Nobody by mistake with a leg touched the, this transponder. So they call it classified as a technical glitch and no more. And then we're moving on to American Airlines. So you see that I don't have any specific agenda just for Singapore or Asia. American Airlines back in September, couple of uh, planes concurrently on the same week, you have uh, sounds of moaning uh, in the PA. What is it? The, the, the air crew doesn't know what's going on. Eventually, apparently, they upgraded a lot of their uh, amplifiers or, or some of the components, and it came with a you know, benefit, some moaning inside. Again, they call it technical and moved on. This was at least admitted as a real cyber. Uh, this company called uh, Jefferson, small company that does all the flight uh, electronic handbooks, that does uh, the flight mapping, 
It got hit severely by a cyber attack to the point that for three weeks, airline instructed their pilots, do not upgrade your, uh, uh, your maps, your flight maps. Don't upgrade. Assume everything is okay. This is start becoming very, um, very, very challenging. So I can go over, this is Bangladesh. Uh, you know, we have a lot from all over the world. Uh, UK, for those of you coming from Europe, mostly data theft, mostly not specific in aircraft, but it's happening a lot in the aviation. This uh, recent uh, malware seems to be a little bit more serious in this industry. And finally, just because you know we are here three days ago, again, American Airlines and Southwest Airlines showing, hey guys, we have a challenge. So the challenges are here. What's the problem or what's the issue? And I think over here I'm going to share with you what I learned over the last year since I talked over here in the panel until today. The first term, it's not my problem. You talk to airlines, you talk to other players in the industry. What about cyber? No, no, it's not my problem. It's there. And there could change, you know, it's Boeing, it's Airbus, it's the airline. Nobody wants to take ownership because it's a little bit too complex. Some of the pilots, we're asking them, and I don't want to mention the name of the airline, what do you do around cyber? And they said in different words, cyber what? We don't do anything about cyber. We are not trained on cyber because it actually does not relate to the aircraft. By the way, it does. It does. And finally, and I think this is Cornell when you, you mention it, regulation is getting there. Awareness is there. I'll talk about it in two minutes. Surprisingly, in some places, the airports themselves are looking how to increase the level of cybersecurity, what to demand from the airline who landing or from maybe business jet to landing. They're actually looking, are you cyber safe? Have you done assessment? Can you provide any documents? So we're looking in an industry that is looking for a solution. And remember what I will tell you in the end, we need to start someplace. So remember that because I will get back to it. Who owns cyber? So we started talking to flight operation because they own the aircraft. They said cyber what? And then we talked to CISOs and it was very refreshing. At least they understand our vocabulary. They understand what we're talking to them. Yes, cyber is important. How do you do anything around the aircraft? No, 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 it's not me. It's the flight operation. So I think airline needs to take a decision at some point in time and rather do it sooner than later, a POC, like you mentioned, point of contact. Somebody needs to own it. If you look at the EASA, the European regulator, they are clearly stating what needs to be done and when. Time. The, se the, next, the next answer I get is, yeah, you know what, uh, I think cyber is very important. I'm not sure we need to start now, maybe in two years' time. Why? Because maybe he's going on a pension. He doesn't want to get his, wet, his feet wet on something that he has no clue. But they really are afraid. I'm talking about top-level airlines around the world, all players in the industry. It's not simple. And finally, two things on, on, on the, before we get into solutions. You mentioned it, but it's actually when we are coming in, we are between the IT and the operation between the IT and the engineering, and a friend of mine who, whom we met yesterday, we'll talk later here, thank you Wes, he said, you're actually bridging between IT and operation, IT and engineering, a good solution on managing cyber touches both ends. Interestingly, I'm gonna use this terminology because I think it's important. And final point over here, follow the money, cram uh, how do you call it, uh, the money trail. Talk to the customers, potential uh, airline, others, how much does it cost them a cyber attack? How much can they actually save if they invest correctly? Some of them may even do new generation of new revenue generation. Okay, so this was the, lo the challenging part, but there is positive around it. First of all, regulator. Finally, you mentioned, I think that some of you mentioned that uh, Talking about cyber started in 2015. Actually, talking about cyber in avia aviation started 2016. At that time, it was, we recommend 
to do A, B, C, D. Very vague kind of thing. Fast forward 2022, some of those regulators are saying you must do A, B, C, D. And by the way, we give you a timetable, Europe, February 2026, mark your calendars. By that time, the EASA in Europe saying you need to implement. What do you need to implement? Exactly what you said earlier, and I have it on the slide. I didn't correlate with you, but this is what it is. So they come up with lots of uh, element and regulation, and it was uh, the TSA and the EASA. I mean, so many combination of words, but the bottom line, they're shifting gears. They're saying somebody needs to be responsible. You need to take action, and we'll show in a second what are the action. Luckily, also, the industry itself is gearing up. Uh, last year, Boeing signed up here uh, uh, some sort of an MOU with uh, our INCD, finally talking about cyber, accepting ideas, etc. Uh, Boeing used to be uh, very, very close. We met them two years ago. They, at that time, they said, we still keep our kimono closed, but eventually they start talking. Airbus have a lot of investment in that. MROs, such as Lufthansa Technik, uh, looking into this uh, ecosystem and saying we need to use cyber to teach cyber, cyber to uh, do assessment around it. Interestingly, at least everybody is interested to talk. Airlines, some of them are very advanced, so this is a positive. Some others saying it's not my problem, but we are trying to convince them it is. Almost final slide, so I will be within your timing. Uh, if, if there are so many things, let's do something. And I think our philosophy in aviation start anywhere, just start. Don't wait. And what can you do? Awareness, training. What is cyber all about around the aircraft? Sharing, you mentioned it, because if we share information, the other parties can help us. It's not something to keep as a secret. Processes, who, who you talk to when. There was a, what was it, what movie was it? Call, call you or something, I think a Ghostbusters. Who do you call? You call uh, somebody over here, uh, but I think we need to, to set it up. And it's simple, it doesn't touch the actual aircraft. It doesn't need all kind of uh, certification or processes. Point of contact, you mentioned, I won't repeat it. Education, training, risk assessment. Do risk assessment, there are many ways to do. We're expert in that. Do risk assessment to your asset, already part of the regulation. Uh, and we can help the airline. There are no many airlines over here, but we definitely look at it. And we're looking for solutions that do not require four or five years of uh, accreditation to be airborne. I would like to finish with, with uh, just secure it. You know, start someplace. Start someplace. The minute you start, your uh, insurance companies will say, ah, oh, those guys are good. Maybe I will not increase their premium this year. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies. <laughs>Done more than put it up on the fucking wall. All right. I think forward. All right, we're going to have a little bit of fun. Uh, first and foremost, the slides are actually relatively sensible and relatively civilized for two reasons. Um, one, because I finished them while I was actually serving whiskey about half an hour, an hour ago while I was over at B-Sides. And secondly, I've had like an entire couple of days here of doing fun slides with crazy things. So we're going to keep it a little bit more sensible on this one. Uh, the topics that everybody's talking about are fairly sensible. There's actually the couple of folks I've already caught with rather interesting. Uh, the train folks, I've got some commentary on, purely because the last time I looked at Amtrak, they still had, uh, what the hell was that one? What was the bleed one? Heartbleed. 
Heart bleed was still running on the trains if anybody still fancies having some fun with those. Are we recording this? We are, aren't we? Oh, good. All right, where am I pointing? Yes, sorry, I'll just use this. So we've had a couple of conversations about where we are today. Some of this is going to be nice, some of this is not going to be nice. Um, well, if I summarize it, we're mostly good at sorting out passengers when it comes to actually understanding safety and security. We're not great, but we're mostly good. I actually had a fantastic conversation with a, a gentleman at London Heathrow Airport that was having good conversations with me getting onto the LL flight uh, Wednesday slash Thursday. And he summarized it. He's like, hey, we've been good at doing physical security when people get to the airport. Prior to that, we'll have that conversation in a minute. We're getting there when it comes to digital twins. The model that's currently employed in the aviation world is I'll sell you an airplane and PSL might sell you a couple of engines to go with it and I'll build a digital twin around them. That's great, but what about the rest of the sodding airplane? We're not bad at audio and visual surveillance. Airports themselves are getting rather good at a lot of this stuff. We pull a lot of the metrics out of it, but again, we have an entire world to go through, and how much can we actually correlate and cross-reference around that will all depend entirely upon how people want to collaborate. That is a word that will come up a lot, and that is a word that we need to probably put on our foreheads more often than not. We're getting the greasy bit sorted out. I am very fortunate. Actually, I'm not fortunate at the moment because our experimental jet's currently out in Mojave doing the final ground testing before we kick it up in the air. I don't get to smell the greasy bits anymore because they're not in Colorado. But we're getting better at sorting out the greasy bits. As one of my previous esteemed colleagues said, the engineering side knows what the hell they're doing. The cybersecurity side in most organizations don't talk to them. That sucks. I'm fortunate, I'm ridiculously fortunate at Boom, where I sit in my office, right next to me is the CIO. Literally, a couple of doors down from him is Chief Engineering. We collaborate. Another one of those words that we're going to use a lot. We're getting the safety sorted, although a lot of the conversations, again, as my previous colleague said, we're still kind of misclassifying what we define as safety versus security versus an oops technical glitch. And we sure as shit are lacking on security when it comes to the digital world, as bluntly as I can put it. We're also still really, really good at excuses. Man, we are so freaking good at excuses. We're really good at saying the words, but like anything, because we were all taught, actions speak louder than words. So what are we planning for? And this is more a boom-centric conversation, because the nice thing about it is I run digital security, not just for the enterprise, but for the aviation side of the world. That thing from nuts and bolts all the way to some of the bloody systems that we're going to be putting in there that some of you will probably want to try to sell us will go through my greasy mitts. Good luck to all of you. I also run physical security, which means I get to do all the pieces, and it's done right. We can cross-reference and collaborate, something that INCD in Israel knows all too well, something the rest of the industry could probably bloody learn from. Here's what we're working on. Actual, usable threat intelligence. The ability to look outside our four walls and maybe know what's hitting us before it actually does. The ability to process that information. I'll make sure these slides are available to everybody. I see pictures being taken. I have no problem with it. But if anybody actually wants the slides or needs them, I will make them available. And I'm happy to talk about this stuff as well. Adaptive situational awareness. Shit changes. Having a plan today does not mean it will be any use tomorrow. Most of us coming out of this know that. The very first bullet that gets fired means your plan goes to pieces. The same unfortunately happens in our space. The best laid plans typically fall to pieces. This is why we test and we test. We do tabletop exercises continually. Most organizations don't. Cross-platform orchestration. When you sell me a passenger experience piece or you sell me something on the electronics, or for those of you that are following the news, and we just announced at Paris last week that uh, we've got the fuselage, wings, and a whole bunch of other bits and pieces. As those things report out, we're going to take a copy of those bits of data, and we're going to do some interesting stuff to them. Hello, how are you doing? She's amazing, by the way. 
You looked after us yesterday. What? What did I do? Yeah, she's like seriously fucking amazing. So we had a we had a talk yesterday. Uh, we were giving a t sorry squirrel moments. It's me. We were doing a talk yesterday on uh, the Ukrainian situation, and, and I kind of got dug into that for a variety of reasons. Since she was making sure that we were all looked after and moderated properly, more efficient safety and security, efficient and effective. Not just saying the words, but actually doing it. And as it says, our passengers are our lifeblood. In cybersecurity, we have one fucking job. One job, not to make money, not to make millionaires or billionaires. One job, protect. Nothing else matters. So when you sit in your fucking silo and you go, well, it's not my job. Oh, I'm in airframes. I don't do that shit. Or I don't want to talk to the engineers because it's not my job. Or when Boeing says, well, we're not going to do this because that's up to the airlines. And the airline says, well, it's up to somebody else. And Talas and Panasonic go, well, it's not our job. You're all a bunch of assholes. It's all of your jobs. And because I'm building the airplane, guess what? It's my job. I will ask all the awkward questions. Nice as I can put it, please be warned. And it's time to treat the passengers that way. Every single one of you has one job, and it's to treat those passengers and make sure they can get from point A to point B as safely and securely as possible. That's it. So please collaborate. So how do we do it? Well, we can collaborate. The physical and digital. Boom has taken that role and said, hey, everything physical, everything digital, it's the same thing. Let's roll it all up. From the technology standpoint, we can cooperate. Now, cooperation is an interesting one. I'll talk about this in a second. I think I've got another reference to Boeing in here somewhere. Not a bad one for a change. Uh, we can cooperate. The efficient analytics. Again, if you are giving me something and you can pull data off, I would love to, too, pull data off. Share that data. Because your data on its own may tell you something, but if I cross-reference that data with something else on an airframe or with a passenger or a geolocation or a physics environment or something else, I might get a different result. But if you don't share it, I don't know. And I'm sure as hell don't want to steal the damn stuff. I will, but I don't want to. The communication. We talk about regulation. There were some good conversations, and I am pleased to see that regulations get there. But guess what? It doesn't get there as fast as real life. Stop waiting for it. Somebody referenced that healthcare is getting there. We've had HIPAA in the US for what? 20 years or so? 20 ish years? When was the last hospital breach? Yeah. Right. We lose, as an industry, cybersecurity loses 22 million pieces of data. Social security number, passports, healthcare information, all that kind of stuff, every single day. Regulation working? Don't think so. Do the right thing. Not the tick in the box. And by the way, tick in the box, not dick in the box, my English language. Community. It was pointed out by my previous presenter. Cybersecurity in our industry started in 2015. Officially it did. Unofficially, 2009 is when we started doing research. And yet it took six years before anybody paid attention. It's taken another quite a number of years us to be here having these conversations. I love the fact that the US chap stood up and said, hey, let's make this bigger. I'm all for it because you all want to keep traveling. And we all want to keep putting artificial intelligence in shit and we don't want to put safety and security around it efficiently and effectively. So work together. And we're working on predictive stuff. Talk about that in a second. So let's actually talk about the technology that we're building, we're putting in place, and we want to collaborate with people on. Everybody keeps talking about artificial intelligence. Most people have no freaking clue what the hell it actually is, which is kind of fun. There was a conference here about it. Hopefully some of you attended, and if you didn't, I would recommend watching the YouTube videos. We're actually building what we would classify as a narrow AI model. In other words, we're building something that knows how the hell to make a cup of tea, but nothing else. If it makes the cup of tea properly, it tells us that. If it doesn't make the cup of tea properly, it explains why to a general AI system. 
but then can look across a whole bunch of narrow systems and understand an entire ecosphere. In other words, we're not just putting general AI, crossing our fingers and hoping for the best. We're looking at this properly. The wings that we buy, they will have a narrow AI architecture that helps me understand what's going on that will cross-reference cross with another narrow A system that's dealing with, say, geospatial information, temperature information, the same route that we did yesterday information. And we'll build metrics around that, and that will be ruled by a general AI architecture. We'll build cross-platform relationships so that data can talk efficiently and effectively among systems. Some of this I've already built. Some of this I want to work with people on. Probability analytics. We are letting the most unstable element on this planet into our aeroplanes. They're called humans. They pay for the experience, but that doesn't mean they're any more stable. I want to know who is coming on my aeroplane. I want to know the potential risks of those people coming onto my airplane. I want to know the probability from a country standpoint, from a location standpoint. The fact that you posted on social media yesterday your mental state of health might elevate some of those probability risks. How much of that will I be allowed to do and can I do and should I do? It's a really freaking good question that I'm going to answer over the next couple of years. How much of it do I want to do? All of it. How much will it wait? Depends what country it's coming from. Now, notice I say I'm doing this. Because I'm not going to say it's not my job, let's do it to the airlines. I'm not going to say it's not my job, it can be dealt with by somebody else, by whoever buys the airplanes. I want to hand over a fucking airplane that works properly from day one. Part of the reason we're building our own bloody engines. You want it done right, you do it yourself. Sometimes. Ish. And adaptive. We talk about it. Part of my job has been over the last couple of years to build adversarial intelligence engines. In other words, we get to poison them and have them watch them eat themselves. I have every expectation that somebody will try that against me. So I won't use a static base of data. I'll look at yesterday's data, but I'm also going to look at last week's and last month, and I'm going to look at trending, and I'll look at last year's data for the same time. Then I'll cross-reference it with the weather and with the environmentals and what the hell the wing is doing versus the landing gear versus the pressure versus the bloody PID IDs that are running around the network. And we'll go from there. But then I'll build that base and continue to build it. This isn't rocket, literally, well, we have rocket scientists on stuff, which is kind of fun. But this shit ain't rocket science. This is easy stuff, but we don't do it, or we haven't done it. Yes, I am fortunate. I get to build this stuff from the ground up. Time's up. I'm almost done. I've got one slide left. Two slides. Ish. <laughs> We're building a digital twin of the plane. We're doing it for a couple of reasons. One, because I get to play with it. Secondly, because when the FAA goes, what in hell's name did you do 20 years ago? I can hand them the digital twin of that plane and go, all yours, little buddies. There's my data reference. Done. Not just aviation, but passenger, experience, geo, the whole lot. You should be able to look back at the history of that thing and go, what the hell did it do? When did it do it? How did it do it? And why? And what did we learn? The whole idea of this is to build something that learns. As somebody already said, we don't know what the future holds. Quite right. Well, let's see if we can build a predictive model that actually helps us understand some of it. And by the way, Boeing is doing some pretty cool stuff here. I don't know who's from Boeing. They probably haven't thrown a rock at me yet. But if you're there, I know who you are. Let's collaborate, please. It would be nice to do that for a change. You can see the rest. Mean deviation and a hybrid AI model. I love computers, but I don't trust them further than I can throw the stupid things. Let's use humans still. We are, again, the most unstable thing out there. So some closing thoughts. As it says, regulation is great. I am really happy the fact that it's moving. Do not get me wrong. But I also don't want it to be a regulation that becomes a tick in the box, because that's fucking useless and not worth the paper or time it's written on. If you've got regulation, bloody well do it properly. But by the way, don't wait for it to turn up before you actually do something about it. Again, back to the humans. We're all in this together. For me standing up here growling and yelling, 
It's kind of I'm passionate about this world and this environment. I care. I, care, I don't care about people, but I do care about people. <laughs> I don't like humans. But as the CISO for Boom Supersonic, I have one role and one responsibility, to protect. And I will sure as hell do my damnedest to do it. And some of you all are going to have to come and work with me, whether you love it or not. So let's try to do it together effectively and efficiently, please. And let's bring fresh eyes. My ugly ass has got more gray hair than I care to think of it, including my actual ass. I want younger generation in here. Let's not put the barriers up to bringing the younger generation in. Let's freaking bring them in without the degrees and all the other crap. Bring them in, train them up from the beginning. And we're leading. We're lucky. We've got a greenfield site. We're putting a ready go big factory on the stupid thing. Use us as an excuse to trial things and help with things and build things. I'm up for it. And we want to collaborate. <coughs> Hope the rest of you are up for it too. With that, I will shut the hell up. Thank you very, very much, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. And now, some uh, takeaways from pilot type training experiment will be given by my dear colleague, Mr. Tamir Goren. Tamir is a director of strate strategic programs at INCD. He leads the strategic program, including the national aviation, maritime, railways, and earth program. He's in charge of national and international initiatives and collaboration aim to enhance cybersecurity in these sectors in Israel and globally. Tamir, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So uh, two points. A, uh, coming after uh, Chris Roberts is a big mistake. And, and I arranged the schedule, so I only have myself to, uh, to blame. Uh, two, we are uh, behind. We know that. But coming to an Israeli transportation uh, summit, you could have expected it. Uh, but the good news is that uh, uh, there will be food when you go out, so uh, thank you for staying. Uh, I'll try to be quick, but tell you about this uh, uh, very interesting experiment that we did uh, together with the Civil Aviation Authority of Israel, uh, the Civil Aviation Authority of France, and ASL uh, Airlines. Um, and the goal was to look uh, at the necessity of uh, pilot cybersecurity training. A bit of background, um, as uh, Avi uh, uh, told us very clearly, airplanes are becoming more digital, more connected, uh, and with that, the attack surface obviously grows. Uh, we did a, a risk survey called the Hercules at the INCD that looked at the whole aviation ecosystem, and part of that was the aircraft. Now, this was um, a theoretical, a TARA process. Uh, we did not do any penetration testing. We did not have any inside information uh, from Boeing or anyone, but uh, we had uh, good Israeli uh, ethical hackers looking at uh, uh, the information they could find and trying to think what they can do uh, to an e enabled aircraft, and they came up with 71 uh, different uh, scenarios. Uh, luckily, none of them were critical uh, and catastrophic results, so none were very easy to execute and catastrophic results. Uh, but there were uh, a big bunch that were in the uh, medium and high uh, levels, uh, so that's enough justification to look into aircraft uh, cybersecurity. Now, airplanes today obviously uh, at least were. Now the new ones, Chris had to leave, but the new ones hopefully are designed with uh, all these elements, but the ones, the planes we are flying today, uh, do not they have the intrusion detection uh, or prevention systems, did not have access control, they even don't have this uh, a cyber warning for their pilot. They don't have that. Um, now, previous research has been done and did uh, recommend pilot training, but it did so in uh, more uh, uh, general terms. These are just some uh, uh, examples of uh, research uh, uh, that has been done. Um, and we wanted to test this more um, formally. Now, why not train, actually? Why not just have these scenarios, put them in the simulators, and have the pilots train. Well, apparently it's not so simple. Uh, one, there's a big financial impact on the airlines. It costs a lot of money. Many of the simulators are uh, abroad for many airlines. It costs a lot. Uh, the time in the simulator is limited. All the pilots have to train on safety issues, 
uh, on malfunctions. So if you want to add something, it needs to be very uh, thoroughly uh, uh, proven that it's needed. There is the potential of negative training. We don't want our pilots now to stop trusting their instruments uh, when they are flying because maybe uh, someone hacked it, uh, especially if it's not uh, uh, really reasonable. Uh, so there is that danger. Uh, and as I said, there's the priority versus the other scenarios that are currently in the syllabus for training. Eventually, uh, similar training is highly regulated. It's ICAO and then the uh, civil aviation authorities that define what every pilot needs to train on in the simulator, and that is exactly what the airlines do, nothing more than that. Not less, but not more. So what did we do? Um, we wanted, to, as I said, to examine the necessity for pilot cybersecurity training, or actually check if training actually improved the performance in the cockpit. Uh, we wanted to test class training uh, and simulator training, there were a lot of uh, um, constraints that didn't allow us to do everything we wanted, so I will talk about what we did and what we took away from it. Now, when we chose the scenarios that we were uh, uh, going to train or, or uh, put the pilots go through, we wanted scenarios that are significant enough, so we want an effect. We don't want something that happens uh, in the network and has no effect. That uh, doesn't make sense, obviously. We wanted things that are technically reasonable. Now, we didn't take scenarios, that we didn't do the technical uh, experiment, we didn't claim that these specific scenarios are possible on this specific model that the simulator was. We just wanted something that is not completely wild and unreasonable. Um, we wanted scenarios where the pilot actions matter, where the pilot actually can do something about it. Um, and that uh, can be simulated in the simulator. There are some scenarios that the simulator, as it's built, just doesn't support. So these were the uh, criteria. And we came up with five different uh, uh, scenarios. I won't go into uh, each one, um, but happy to, to answer afterwards. One is, was uh, ADSB uh, signal spoofing. So that's actually an attack on the ground station. Someone is uh, transmitting an ADSB message as if it were the airplane, but with wrong uh, data or spoof data. Uh, fake ACARS message, this is a message that comes up in the cockpit and, and comes out of the printer actually, uh, and that came with a false load sheet update. So it said the uh, weight that you calculated when you took off, we had a mistake, sorry, uh, the plane is um, uh, lighter or, or the uh, center of gravity changed. Uh, we tried, we did spoofing of fuel consumption. This is probably out of the five, this is the most problematic or hard to do for an actual attacker because these are the actual avionics of the aircraft. It's not something uh, external, uh, but we wanted to see what happens. And the reason we spoofed the fuel up and not down is that if we spoof the fuel down, the pilot will get a, a, a light, he has a, a procedure to go through, Everything is very clear, but when we take the level up, nothing happens in the aircraft, uh, and then it's more uh, interesting. Uh, there was GPS spoofing, and finally uh, a ground proximity, a fake ground proximity warning. This is the route the simulation uh, the pilots uh, flew, um, and that is the, those are the five scenarios. Uh, we had uh, two days in the simulator. We were able to do uh, eight operational crews, two pilots each, so 16 pilots from uh, ASL uh, airlines. And then we divided them. Uh, of course, they didn't know what they were coming from. For We had a story. We told them they were coming to test the uh, effectiveness of e-learning uh, decks before a flight. And indeed, two groups each got uh, e-learning. But one of them got uh, e-learning about uh, um, some system in the rudder, not relevant to cyber, and the other half got that presentation, but also uh, a deck about cybersecurity uh, risks to the aircraft ba based on Hercules. Um, and that had actually all the, all the scenarios that they were going to encounter were there in the deck, among many others. Um, now, we, didn't, uh, we weren't able to do a real class training half day with an instructor. We couldn't have them go through these or cyber scenarios in a simulator before. 
Eventually what it amounted to was an e-learning deck uh, that they went uh, through on their own before the flight as part of the preparation. Uh, half went through the deck, the e-cybersecurity, half did not. Uh, this is the simulator. It's an actual real um, uh, Boeing 737 simulator that ASL uses uh, for their training. So the, the simulation was as real as it gets. What did we find? So uh, insight number one was there is very, and it's not surprising, there is very low cyber awareness by all crews. None of the crews understood that they were going through a series of cybersecurity incidents. None of them understood they were going into, uh, through any cybersecurity incident. Um, and the most surprising thing, there was no significant difference between the two groups. Even the pilots that went through this e-learning e deck on their own, but went through this deck 20 minutes before they boarded the simulator, once they were in the cockpit, in the regular environment, things were happening, they just didn't connect it to cybersecurity. Um, in the fuel scenario, which I said is very interesting, uh, many of the crews, they did read that there are points in the flight after the grow run, they do check the fuel level. And they saw, they read it's higher than what they saw before. In most cases, it did not uh, raise an alarm. In some cases, it said, hmm, okay, weird. In some cases, it didn't, uh, they didn't sense the change at all. Uh, so that was very interesting in terms of a cyber scenario that can, an attacker that can do unusual stuff. Uh, flight safety was never compromised. Eventually, now the scenarios were chosen, as I said, they're not extreme. We did not shut down the engine or uh, interfere with the uh, controls. But nevertheless, have they done something completely wrong? Uh, they could have gotten into a, a safe incident. That didn't happen. They used uh, their existing procedures. Uh, cross-checks with a controller between them, uh, and general airmanship, what we call uh, in Hebrew, just common sense in flight and uh, situational awareness, and they managed to avoid danger. Um, and I said this. And the third uh, insight was that the simulator training itself did raise the awareness. So what the deck didn't do, the experiment itself, after we told them what they experienced, that did have an effect, and uh, uh, there was a survey sent after the experiment, and the feedback was that, indeed, now, next time they encounter something like this, this will be uh, in their minds. So, three uh, takeaways. Um, one, once we decide that cyber security, and, and again, it's, uh, we're not saying this right now, it's, uh, it needs to go through more research, and eventually it will be uh, a risk assessment by the different airlines and by the uh, civil aviation authorities. But when we decide that there is need to train pilots on cybersecurity, we need to do something more robust than just a uh, uh, one-time e-learning deck. It needs to be either in class, it needs to be repetitive. Ideally, uh, having them train on it in simulator, uh, that is uh, to be determined. Uh, two, there are very different types of cyber attacks, okay? There are cyber attacks that the effect will align with malfunctions or with just with the existing uh, operational procedures. Those are probably the simplest. Uh, the ones that are actually don't have an SOP, those will be the most uh, challenging, and that's where um, awareness, alertness, um, and uh, consultation will come into play. Uh, Third takeaway was that it's not only the pilots. In a few of these scenarios, the best solution was to talk to the controller and make sure, or to call back to operations, right? If you got an update to the uh, weight level, don't just punch it in. It's, it's not a secured communication. Contact your operations, ask, did you send this? Um, so the whole ecosystem supporting uh, the crews also needs to be aware of this uh, risk. Um, that is it. Uh, Eli is here from the CAI. He can uh, add more now uh, uh, in the panel that we'll go into. Um, but another step uh, towards uh, awareness and, uh, uh, you know, Chris said we're not moving uh, fast enough. Perhaps Boeing, by the way, are not here. Maybe it's a good thing. 
Um, but we are moving, and this was a, a, another step in the right uh, direction, hopefully. Thank you. And uh, we move directly to the panel. Okay, so now we'll have a... Thank you. So now we'll have a panel. I want to uh, invite our panelists. Uh, Eli Aluk, Head of Regulation Department, Civil Aviation Authority of Israel. Wes Chan, CISO of Air Canada. Wes, you here? Yeah, coming down. Uh, Tsofit Shachar, VP Cyber Strategy at Cybex and former CISO of El Al Airlines. And Roni Tidhar, Head of Cyber Division in the Israeli Airport Authority. Yeah. And thank you all uh, survivors and apologies to the panel for being the last uh, uh, on this day, but uh, I think the, we have a smaller but very uh, interested audience. Those who stayed are definitely into it. Okay, so uh, let's start with you, uh, uh, Wes, and then uh, Sofit. Uh, as airline CISOs, uh, present and uh, past, um, what threats are the top priority, do you think, for civil uh, aviation today? Wes, you want to go first? Yeah, I, I, can, I, I can kick things off. So just as a show of hands here, who's, who's taken a flight in the last year? <laughs> that's, that's pretty much everyone. So that's a good thing. Um, so, so if you look at the numbers, uh, for, for flights right now, um, a lot of countries, um, a, a lot of places are uh, back to pre-pandemic numbers as far as passenger counts goes, um, which, which is good for, for aviation, uh, good, good for our business. But the, um, the, the problem is um, it, it was very challenging, um, you know, coming back from the pandemic, getting everyone back on board. Uh, we had flight, we had flight crew shortages. Um, we had system issues. Um, just a, a really tough time to to get things kick started again. And, and so, what we've been forced to do is move to digital. So, so lots of things you're seeing in the airport now, uh, you know, are are digital. I think Emirates right now is uh, moving to fully, or if they've already fully moved to digital boarding passes. Um, Wi-Fi on aircraft are becoming very, very popular and common as well. Um, and then just general app usage is uh, become very, very common. So when I think about cybersecurity, um, it's across the entire ecosystem right now, um, from the entire customer experience from booking your flights um, all the way to getting on the aircraft and even sometimes just even post flights as well. So it's a, a very, very dynamic um, uh, environment that you know, I'm, I'm trying to protect here for, for Air Canada. And then a lot of the previous speakers, you know, that spoke before me, you know, they're speaking a lot about, um, you know, OT security, aircraft security, um, and just some other elements of the environment that are also very, very challenging. So those are uh, th those are top of mind, and those are some of the things that I'm uh, I'm also worried about. Thank you. So if I need to point um, the major threats risk in aviation uh, industry, the first area is ransomware. Ransomware attack is here to stay. It's very associated or related uh, lately with the syndicates or cybercrime gangs. So ransomware is here to stay, and we will see it more sophisticated. Uh, your control uh, claimed lately that uh, aviation industry suffered or faces with ransomware once a week. So this is very uh, high concerns, and we are seeing large-scale espionage from ransomware attack. Um, we are seeing more and more sophisticated ransomware attack using uh, technique, uh, using double extortion, triple extortion. The bad guys um, implement th two keys or three keys to uh, decrypt uh, the data. The second is the data breaches. We read about, uh, I'm sure all of us read about uh, data breaches. And the third, if I need to point the threat, um, is the supply chain attack. I, I think Avi mentioned it before, the Jeppesen, the subsidiary of Boeing, 
This is the three uh, major threats that aviation need to concern. Uh, in addition, on top of that, of course, there is a phishing attack, uh, um, some uh, state actors attacks, and physical at attacks, of course. Okay, so a large uh, variety. Ellie, from, from the perspective of the Civil Aviation Authority, uh, we heard uh, the digitization of the uh, aviation, uh, a lot of ransomware, a lot of focus on ransomware and data bridges. What are the threats that uh, concern uh, the national authorities? Um, if I may continue about the ransomware that uh, Sofit mentioned, so uh, <laughs> yes, um, it's a big concern for us too. Our first goal, and uh, will always be our first goal, is to maintain the safety and to assure the safety of operations. And um, I think that in, cer in certain scenario, um, we would like to assure as the Civil Aviation Authority in such incident that uh, safety is not compromised. It's, the, it's, it's our first concern, always. Um, secondly, I, um, I would think about the intention of management. We love that the intention of management will be always to focus on management, the safety. And in such kind of crisis, the intention may go to other um, areas to manage the crisis that can be developed very quickly. And first, in certain scenario, if a payment is delivered, we cannot ignore about the um, um, economic fitness or the financial fitness of the operator, which can be linked to, link to uh, in the in the uh, our future to uh, to be concerned um, because uh, financial fitness of operators is monitored by the CA and it can be indicator for us if the financial fitness is is, is getting poor and we need to be uh, more focused on the specific operator that had such crisis interesting so, so safety is the priority but you are seeing the ways that uh, uh, financial tax might eventually impact safety as well. Yeah, it becomes a concern. Okay, uh, Ronnie, what about the airport? What are the unique threats uh, to the airports? There are no unique threats to airports. All right. Thre threatening us. <laughs> uh, that's basis. I, I think uh, what we should fear for uh, not only in IAA but also, uh, also uh, uh, globally the security syndrome. Uh, those airports that think that they are secured enough say, okay, we're secured enough. We don't need to invest in cybersecurity too much. Just talk about it. Uh, the others just let go. We, are, we still have ground to cover. Let's do physical security and cybersecurity. Let's leave it, like I said before, to the engineers, to, uh, to IT uh, uh, professionals, but we don't uh, deal with that. Uh, that is concer very concerning regarding security equipment. They, they get more and more uh, uh, complicated, and, uh, connected, uh, and still not always uh, air-gapped or, or otherwise protected. Uh, I, I'm very happy uh, on, last, uh, several, on several last uh, uh, international forums that uh, I attended uh, to hear everybody starting to talk about cybersecurity. Once again, I'm not... Uh, the first one to say it here, action counts, not talking about Agreed. Okay, now, OS, uh, uh, you're uh, a big uh, airline. You see a lot of, uh, and you're the CISO. You see the threats coming in. You see the uh, alerts. Who are the attackers? Who, is, uh, who do you identify attacking Air Canada? And, and do you think it's different between uh, a Canadian company, for example, and an Israeli airline? And, no. So sure. So, so I, I am Canadian. I work for Canada, and it's my first time in Israel as well. So, uh, very, very warm welcome. Thank you. So, uh, you have several flights a day. You can come more. <laughs> I'll definitely visit a lot more. Now, now, now culturally. So, so the, the big attackers, and uh, you know, I think a few folks, you know, I've, you know, with the the Russia-Ukraine war and some of the um, the fallout from that, I think I think that's common across both both Israel and Canada. Um, the the thing that I've noticed that's very different is um, just just the culture of uh, uh, Israel and, and Canada, just the nation itself. Um, 
you know, I was in Jerusalem on, on, on Sunday uh, with a few folks. And for Canadian, uh, I'm just not used to walking around um, just, just a public place um, where uh, there's such a heavy army presence. Um, it, our, our friends that like guns are south of us. Um, up in Canada, uh, we're too busy dealing with the cold and snow, so we don't, we don't really have a lot of that. So what, what's, what's very interesting for us, um, and I think for the world, is um, that a lot of cyber criminals like to attack um, us in the US and Canada. And, and, and the reason I think for that is um, that there's a lack of personal accountability um, for, for us in Canada. So, so the best example I can give is, um, you know, if I, if I drop my cell phone and, and break a screen, I'll, I'll just bring it back to the store and say, hey, I, I, don't, I don't know what happened. Uh, can, I, can I get a refund? And it's like, oh, yeah, no, 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 no problem. Here's a new phone. Um, it's the same as uh, same with credit cards as well. I mean, to, uh, to to you know, let's say buy something or not buy something, and just say, yeah, I I don't know, I, I don't know who bought that uh, that that piece of clothing, that you know, five hundred dollar pair of shoes or whatever. That that wasn't me. And the and Visa, Mastercard, or or Amex will take care of that for you, right? So so what tends to happen as well is for a lot of airlines, we run a um, uh, a loyalty points program, um, which are very very popular. And so it's the same mentality across these points programs as well, where um, uh, you know, remember accounts that have you know 100,000 million points, they can use these points to buy Amazon gift cards. Um, they can you know, use it to buy kitchenware, to book flights, um, and, and so it becomes a very, very popular target for cyber criminals. Um, and, and because of the the mentality and the culture in Canada, um, there really isn't any personal liability or anything with those points. So a lot of attackers like to attack us with our points program. Um, we're constantly seeing that every single day um, where member accounts get, get hijacked, uh, account takeovers, um, you know, things of that nature. And, uh, and, and those... Um, and <laughs> th th yeah, those points get stolen constantly. And that's, for us as an airline, that's just a, a cost to us. So, so you know, they're fraudsters. You know, they they book flights, um, uh, they they buy gift cards, and uh, we're we're talking in the millions of dollars worth of uh, uh, of cyber criminals here, and then us as an airline just eat that. Interesting. So, so we're combating that with uh, I think some of the things that Sofit kind of here spoke about around ransomware actors and everything else that you kind of see. Uh, we're gonna have to defend against all that. Got it. And uh, so talking about uh, liability, uh, Eli, how is uh, regulation uh, going to handle that? What, what is coming uh, and other threats in aviation as well? Yeah, I think that uh, in AVI presentation, we saw the word the part information security of IASA, which is kind of pioneering regulation, and we follow it very strictly. It's less important what I think, but what our stakeholders think. So last year we convened our all stakeholders, maintenance organization, airlines, NSP airports, and we did kind of mini workshop and to understand those regulations that set the funda fundamentals for any organization to be in place, personnel, procedures, reporting scheme, etc. Very generic. It's one size fits all, and um, our stakeholders, I think. Um, their view that we should go further and to adopt those regulations that are developed in Europe. And uh, this is our intention. Now, the European regulates not only service providers, but also civil aviation authorities. And for us, as civil aviation authorities, it's not very easy. It's very challenging be because um, security and cybersecurity, it's not part of our DNA. It's very challenging for us, and, and we need to do it very rapidly, to move very fast because we are lagging behind the industry here. Um, first and foremost is to recruit the appropriate personnel and to go further. It's, uh, last sentence, um, I think it's a national effort. It's not only the Civil Aviation Authority. Uh, we need to collaborate. It's the Ministry of Transport, the INCD, together um, resources that to be supported by the government. And I think that in over the next year will be development in the oversight capacity in this area. Okay, uh, we're with you and there's a new head of uh, CAI, so uh, hopefully we'll see uh, new energy in this uh, direction.
He knows airports. What's that? He knows airports as well. Yeah, he knows uh, a thing or two. Uh, uh, okay, Ronnie, we talked about uh, cybersecurity training for uh, pilots. Um, what about the rest of the uh, people, employees uh, uh, in IAA and in aviation in general? How, how do you handle it in a, uh, a big organization uh, like IAA? I don't know if in this uh, uh, audience uh, we consider to be big, but uh, we are about 6,000 employees in a uh, warm day. Uh, Starting bottoms up, uh, we need to uh, access and, and get our messages to all our employees, whether they have a, an email address or, or they're working shifts and they don't have a desktop or laptop. Uh, and uh, we do it either via delivering the message on, the pla on those platforms or via uh, uh, briefings by, by duty shift managers. Uh, that, that's basic. Uh, we bring in some uh, training tools every few months uh, and, and trying to, to teach them that way. We are uh, supplying uh, across the organization uh, a physical, uh, sorry, uh, face, uh, face training, uh, classroom training, sorry for uh, back out for a minute, uh, uh, or also hybrid training. Uh, just discuss things and uh, this is not only a uh, one side uh, uh, presentation this is a communication and letting them uh, uh, ventilate uh, whatever problems that they fear or, or things and this is on also as, as for the family lives for the uh, private lives taking some, some aspects because sometimes it is colliding between what they are uh, accustomed to do on their uh, uh, personal uh, time what are they trying to do on, on our uh, networks? Uh, uh, once, one scale up, uh, it's uh, analyzing which uh, sensitive systems operators we have and giving them specific training and specific uh, training tools. Uh, uh, then uh, focusing especially on our critical uh, systems, uh, trying to invade. We, we are bringing people, people to visit our uh, facilities, our SOC. Uh, we are going to their uh, uh, facilities, just starting a, a conversation. And nowadays, you say, a few years back, you said cy cyber, nobody understood. They heard it some, somewhere in the organization, nobody took care. Nowadays, everybody is uh, discussing cyber. More than, they need, more than they should, although they, this is my job. Yet again, more than, than they should. Well, depends. <laughs> in any case of uh, lack of water in the... In the Bathroom, they are calling cyber. <laughs> well, it's sort of success, I would say. Uh, then scaling for, uh, uh, up for uh, uh, managers or, or duty managers or team leaders, uh, trying to get to their uh, specific uh, uh, renewal training and uh, communicate with them, bringing courses, obviously. Uh, we have some, uh, uh, some cyber agenda to each and every uh, uh, employee and, and, and the basic courses, but we're trying to get to the manager's courses to the team leaders courses uh, shift leaders and uh, because they can influence really they understand they understand the subject they know something going on in the shift they, they are the sensor so sort of recruiting them as a, as a, an ambassadors and then touching base, base with management so these are tabletop exercises cross organization uh, with stakeholders and sometimes and of supply representatives, which is very uh, uh, problematic areas for us. Uh, so it can be a facility uh, a drill, like uh, Benguian Airport or Ramon Airport yesterday, uh, doing something like that with uh, cyber-related scenarios. To, uh, and and uh, obviously, they test their BCPs. They don't test the cyber skills or how we will mitigate. But they need to understand how it looks, the, the look and feel of it, and uh, then uh, going to IAA level, and we uh, did uh, once or twice, we did a tabletop exercise for the top management to C-level management. We participate in, in uh, drills uh, with INCD, Ministry of Transportation, and, and more. So we're trying to get every, every skill. Thanks. Impressive. Obviously, fishing uh, drills, sending, uh, and other methods. <coughs>
Def definitely a lot of uh, activity, and I think it also uh, speaks to the uh, rising awareness and uh, uh, willingness of, uh, of managements to invest in this uh, aspect. Uh, and final question uh, will be to you, Sophie, because we really need to uh, free all these people to, to eat. Um, but as uh, Dimitri pointed out, we can't finish uh, the panel without talking about AI. And you're a bit of an expert, so how do you see AI uh, as a disruptive technology affecting uh, cybersecurity, specifically in aviation, going forward. The new buzzword we'll oh, yeah. all love to, to hear. <laughs> uh, but artificial general uh, intelligence both turns offensive and defensive. Very impact on aviation industry. In offensive side, uh, we see the criminals use sophisticated techniques, uh, based on artificial intelligence technologies like evasive techniques uh, who can bypass the defense tool, the traditional tools, even generate a new pattern of attacks that we never seen before. Uh, in the defense side, of course, we have um, used AI to more and analyze. I, I think Chris mentioned before the SOAR, the orchestration to collect all the data uh, and more analyze and, and also recover and uh, response rapidly with AI based on machine learning uh, algorithm. All right, so uh, I think we hear... Uh, uh, Not there yet. Oh, which is a good thing, uh, hopefully, but it will come fast. Uh, okay, so I think we hear uh, a lot of activity, uh, a lot of movement, Hopefully, uh, some of it fast enough, some of it should be faster probably. Uh, I want to thank uh, our panel members uh, very much. I want to thank the surviving audience uh, and have a good lunch. All right, thank you, Tamir. Thank you, panelists. We just landed. Have a nice weekend. Uh, safe journey home. Goodbye, see you next year. <laughs>